Good morning, everyone. Wow, I really didn't think this day would come ever again where I'd be standing in person with so many faces in front of me, so I'm so excited to be here this morning. Welcome to our first in-person Marine Communications Forum since February of 2020. Yay. Before I get started, I just want to thank Michelle Fideli and all of the folks that have worked with her to make this day possible. So thank you if we could give her a round of applause. For those of you who don't know me, which is probably many of you, I'm Peg Fayed. I'm the executive director for First Five Marin, and I've been in this role since August of 2020. So everything has been virtual for me. So this is really a special day. Um, and in opening our forum, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement that we gather on unceded ancestral lands of the coastal Miwok people. We offer respect to the indigenous people of this colonized land and honor their careful stewardship of the land for over 13,000 years. First Five Marin is an organization that's committed to ensuring that all children have all that they need during the first five years of life to be able to enter kindergarten, ready to learn and succeed and to thrive throughout their lives. We've been hosting these marine, communica marine communication forums for a number of years, but as I mentioned, uh, over the last long two years, they've been on Zoom. So we are excited to be pivoting to a more hybrid model. So this is the first of that event. Today, we're here to talk about climate change. And the impacts of climate change put all of us at risk. But not only does it impact our lives today, but it has everything to do with the future of our children. And so for First Five Marin, that makes this a crisis for our most vulnerable children and why First Five Marin is here to support this forum today and stands with all the amazing folks and organizations who live and breathe this work every day. And with that, I'd like to intro a video from Congressman Jared Huffman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. Thanks for giving me the chance to send this video message. I am in Washington, D.C. during your program. Otherwise, I would love to be there with you today. But I do want to thank First Five Marin, Drawdown Bay Area, and Marin Communications Forum for hosting this very important event, Climate Solutions for Marin, the next five years. I'm glad to hear this is going to be a youth-led forum. I'm always impressed and relieved uh, by the intelligence and the passion of today's youth. Uh, you are our future, and I am grateful that you are here. So the time for climate action is obviously right now. In fact, it's past due. Addressing climate change is the greatest moral, economic, environmental imperative that we face as a country and as a planet and the policy decisions and the actions that we collectively take are going to impact not only your future, but every generation that comes next. The climate crisis is here. We're living with it, with rising temperatures, severe weather, mass extinction, uh, our wildlife biodiversity crisis, food shortages, refugee crises. The solutions grow more expensive with every passing year, but the costs of inaction are far greater than the cost of action. The world simply has no time to spare, especially after the terrible four years of the Trump administration where we had inaction and regress. Confronting climate change will require major investments in infrastructure, new technology. It'll bring high quality jobs and energy independence. Pursuing these projects will help us tackle climate change, but they'll also make our country stronger, healthier, and more prosperous. And everyone at every level has an important role to play. And thankfully, California has already taken bold steps to confront and combat climate change, proving that climate leadership and economic prosperity actually can go hand in hand. And locally, I'm proud to represent the North Bay where we have cutting edge commitments to combating the climate crisis. I've worked on these issues ever since my time in the state legislature, and I remain very committed to advancing everything we can do including many of our proven California strategies at the federal level. The science tells us that we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground in order to protect the planet for future generations. So I've introduced legislation to do that, the Keep It In The Ground Act, and a bunch of other bills to break our nation's addiction to fossil fuels by 
permanently barring, for example, new fossil fuel leases on all federal public lands and in federal waters. Under the leadership of President Biden and his negotiating team, the United States is finally leading again with bold commitments, determined diplomacy, and a new sense of urgency, recognizing that the climate crisis uh, is one of those things where winning slowly is the same thing as losing. So I'll keep working with the Biden administration, with my congressional colleagues, to make sure that our federal government is taking the action necessary to meet this important moment. American leadership goes beyond what we're doing here in Washington, DC. It also includes climate solutions that are increasingly being led at the subnational level in the private and public sectors, including local climate champions like you here in the North Bay. The world is falling short right now. We've got to be honest about that in terms of what's needed to preserve a livable planet. And the frightening reality is that the consequences of failure are extreme. But if we succeed in meeting this moment, the upside, building back better with clean energy, creating millions of jobs and securing a cleaner, greener, healthier and more resilient future for everyone, well, all of that is more than worth it. So I look forward to hearing about the results of your forum. I'll work to support your solutions as your representative in Congress, and I hope you have a wonderful, productive day. Now I'd like to introduce someone who's been pivotal in bringing this event together as well, alongside Michelle, Leslie Alden, Executive Director of Drawdown Bay Area. She wears many hats, and many of you have known her when she was an aide to the late Marin County Supervisor Charles McGlashan. So with that, I'd like to welcome up Leslie. Good morning, everyone. What I'm not wearing, maybe all the hats, but I'm not wearing my glasses, so this could be, this could be a little rusty here. Um, it, is, it is wonderful to see faces that are scattered as opposed to in little blocks on a computer screen. And um, I'm, I'm just delighted to see everyone. And, here we are. It's a, it's really a, it's a lovely, lovely day, and I'm so glad that um, Congressman Huffman was able to share his thoughts with us from D.C. Um, and actually, I want to welcome Dr. Itaco Garcia. Um, some of our yes, perfect spot. That is the spot. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, I'm Leslie Alden. I'm the chief instigator and the CEO, or ED, um, of Drawdown Bay Area. And I'll share more about that in a minute. But first, I want to take a moment to see who's in the room. I recognize a lot of you. Um, there was one person that I thought I knew really well and seen many, many times. But actually, we've just been in meetings on Zoom for the last year and a half. And I was really surprised when he said, we finally meet in real life. But, um, so I want to know who's in the room. How many of you are parents? Wow. How many of you are teachers or in education? Wonderful. How many of you have a business? Okay. How many of you are in public service, either as an elected or staff? Wonderful. This is kind of perfect. How many of you are from um, an environmental or sustainability nonprofit? Okay, this is our community. This is lovely. And this is, this is the collaboration and the gathering together of different groups, different parts of our community coming together to talk about a particularly important issue. So raise your hand if you kind of think maybe, maybe you're a climate solutionist. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Be brave, be brave. Well, I hope that when you leave this room today, you feel empowered uh, to be a climate solutionist. So welcome to the first person, first in-person gathering after two years of meeting on Zoom. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, so we all got up early this morning. We got dressed early this morning. We got here early this morning, and no one is wearing sweatpants. <laughs> I'm proud, I'm, uh, although I'm wearing heels and my feet are not so happy, so <laughs> I may kick them off and be patting around in my bare feet very soon. Very good. Perfect. I want to thank First Five Marin again. Um, this is an extraordinary group. Michelle Fideli reached out to me to do this 
several months back, and it seemed like a really good idea at the time. And we weren't sure if uh, Omicron was going to come back at us. We weren't sure what, what the temperature in the community was going to be. So this is just extraordinary to see everyone here. We're filling this room. I want to thank also all of our incredible partners and sponsors. I don't know if you saw the slide earlier um, that showed you know, all, of, all of the lead sponsors and the, the drawdown champions and the climate solutionists, but we have some incredible support across our community and you'll see a lot of um, organizations around the room have tables. I hope you will go up and talk to them and ask them questions. And, and engage and learn and, and, and talk to them and tell them what you know as well. Because I think that that's the sort of integration that we really need to foster across all of our different sort of silos. So please give a round. Okay, we'll do, we'll go. That's fine. <laughs> There are terrific climate efforts going on all around us, across the world, around the Bay Area, in particular, California's been leading, but they're very siloed. And by that I mean we're under-resourced, we are overworked, it's overwhelming, and we're not able to share best practices and resources as well as we should and could. So I'm encouraging everyone to think about that, that we all get very, very focused on what our job is and what our world is, and what we have to be doing is explaining and sharing and talking to others and starting here. This is just sort of a reset for all of us, I think, after the last couple of years. And as, and as uh, Congressman Huffman has said several times, this is, this is the time to act, even though we don't have all the answers, we don't have all the solutions, we have an awful lot of them. We know there's a climate problem, and we have the solutions. The question that I think we ask is, where do we begin? It's overwhelming. The good news is the solutions do exist, and some of them are really easy, and we can do them right now. And others are gonna take working together, really working together, very collaboratively, across sectors, from business to community to government, NGOs, faith-based groups, schools, everybody. The question that I keep hearing from businesses and, and certainly from individuals is, I'm just one person, or I'm just one small business. I'm trying to keep the doors open, make payroll. What can I possibly do that will make a difference? It's overwhelming, it's global. If we, if we have that attitude, we stop, right? So this is a group of people here. You are here because you're interested, you're concerned, and you see that there's hope, there's possibilities. So this is a gathering of, of actors in our community. You are all actors, you're solutionists. We can all do something. And imagine if 7.7 .7 million people in the San Francisco Bay Area all did just something. If everyone did just something, we could make a real difference. So I'll say a couple words about Drawdown Bay Area. We can move faster together with proactive business engagement, concerted citizen action, and strategic government collaboration. And Drawdown Bay Area was set up to really connect business, government, and community to leverage the best practices and resources that we have now and show them widely to a broad audience, not in our, not in our narrow areas of expertise, but broadly. Thank you. We're laser focused on reducing our emissions from the use of fossil fuels, electrifying our buildings and our transportation, and reducing food waste in our landfills and using our natural environment to draw down greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. I hope that who you meet and what you see and hear and talk about today will inspire you and empower you to take the first step and maybe you've already taken a first step or two or three, but maybe you'll take a few more and maybe you'll bring people with you. Speaking of pledges, over here, if you're brave enough, 
you can write on a whiteboard a pledge to the future, a climate action that you're willing to take. Um, could be Meatless Monday, could be I'll ride my bike more, or I'll take public transit again, or I will pledge to make my next car an electric vehicle. There's lots of things you can pledge to do. So I encourage you to do that. We'll take your picture. If we get enough people, we'll, we'll put them up during the, uh, the intermission, the break time. Yeah, I also want to acknowledge actually how hard the last couple of years have been and to acknowledge that we're dealing with multiple crises in the world right now, and it is overwhelming. This has been an uneasy time on so many levels, but we're here today together on a beautiful Friday. I don't know if you guys saw the full moon this morning. It was extraordinary. And there's daffodils on the table, it's spring, so I'm glad you're all here. It is now my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Ms. Reyesa is the new CEO of the Marin Community Foundation, and I'm particularly honored to be able to introduce her this morning. Let me share just a few things about her, and you'll share my enthusiasm. Rhea brings a full breadth of philanthropic, environmental, and public policy experience to the foundation and to Marin County. She's had an illustrious career that precedes this new position, and Marin is lucky that she is in the leadership role. Her substantive expertise includes domestic and international climate policy, terrestrial conservation and natural resource management, environmental justice, and indigenous rights and sovereignty. She has led policy, budget, finance, strategy, and evaluation initiatives throughout her career, and has extensive experience in both legislative and executive branches and with international law and multinational treaties. Before joining the foundation last fall, she was most recently the past president of the Natural Resources Defense Council, where, among other initiatives, she helped steer high-level discussions that led to the historic global climate agreement in Paris in 2015. Thank you. <laughs> She also championed a precedent-setting settlement for the residents of Flint, Michigan, suffering from that city's toxic drinking water crisis that you're all aware of. Before joining NRDC, Rhea joined the Obama White House in 2009 and served as Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget at the U.S. Department of the Interior. She led several cross-cutting initiatives at the department, including establishing a successful diversity program for the National Park Service, and before that, she worked for two of the Bay Area's most esteemed foundations, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. In those roles, she developed programs dedicated to environmental con conservation and clean energy in the West, helped establish a collaboration among nonprofit organizations to coordinate conservation efforts, and helped to develop strategies for reducing climate change emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. She also developed one of the first clean energy and climate change initiatives, also launched a portfolio designed to focus on environmental justice issues for underserved populations. Originally from Boulder, Colorado, please help me welcome Ms. Ria Su to Marin County. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to admit, uh, that was a lovely introduction, um, but I woke up this morning and I was helping my daughter get ready for school and there was a moment where we were both in the mirror at the same time and I looked at myself and I was like, God, I'm getting old. <laughs> so when I hear about all of the background, whatever, I'm like, oh my God, that's a long time to have been living. So anyways, uh, thank you for making that seem so much more wonderful than the reflection in the mirror this morning. Um, I also will echo uh, uh, Leslie's excitement about actually being here in person and seeing people uh, uh, in real time, uh, in real life. Um, I will say if I 
uh, were, a, uh, I guess, a better investor or, uh, I don't know, predictor. Um, I would have both invested in Peloton and Zoom before this pandemic, but also uh, elastic, stretchy clothes. <laughs> so as you can tell, I'm trying to go slowly back into the world of whatever, and I also have high heels on, which I deeply, deeply regret. Um, <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to uh, all of the incredible um, uh, people in this room, including the elected officials, including uh, school leaders, including youth leaders. Um, I have a number of colleagues in the room today, um, including our trustee from uh, the Buck Family Fund, uh, Sharna Dermer, um, as well uh, as um, a number of other uh, distinguished uh, guests um, who are all here today. Uh, because we all recognize um, the issue of climate uh, is here and now urgent um, and we need to come together uh, to be able to address these things. Um, so I actually want to start out my comments today uh, by calling out one of my cardinal intentions, uh, which is honesty. Uh, as Leslie has mentioned, uh, I've done a lot of work for a lot of years on climate and environmental issues. Um, and they were sometimes hard years, um, unfortunately filled with more setbacks than progress. Um, and during that period, I really had personal struggles around trying to figure out how to help instill a sense of hope um, in people about climate um, when, frankly, I myself was feeling increasingly uh, a sense of fear. Um, one example of this. I recall a swanky party uh, that I was a keynote speaker for, um, and not unlike today. Uh, I'm always slightly nervous about getting up in front of a group of people that I don't know, um, uh, but this time my nerves were compacted by a request that I got just before um, I got to the stage, uh, which was as I was being handed the mic from the hostess of this very swanky party, she said to me, whatever you do, Rhea, don't be a bummer. <laughs> so, I will try not to be a bummer today, <laughs> but I will also try to be honest with you. During these turbulent times, I spend my days oscillating between hope and fear. Fear, well, because you can just open the pages of the newspaper to understand what that's about. The pandemic, social and political unrest, racial violence, warfare, the murder of innocents and innocents. And the fact that climate report after climate report not only confirms what scientists have been predicting for years, but identifies the reality that in many cases, those predictions are now worse in reality. These are things like drought, fire, diminishing polar caps, rapidly rising sea levels, um, and mass extinction. We are witnessing, experiencing, suffering, and dying from the reality of a warmed and warming world. You don't need to go to Antarctica, Micronesia, the Horn of Africa, or the Great Barrier Reef to understand this reality. A few sobering statistics in our own neck of the woods. One in eight acres of land in the state of California has already been burned by wildfire in the last 10 years. One in eight. Fires just in Sonoma and Napa counties to the north of us have obliterated thousands of homes, displacing tens and thousands of families. Here in Marin County, we are all just waiting, praying, but understanding that the drought, topography, geography underscore that the wildfire is likely to come here at any point. According to the BCDC, Bay Conservation and Development Commission, the water levels in the bay could rise as much as 16 inches by 2050 and a whopping 55 inches by 2100. In the midst of this reality, the most vulnerable the most segregated, the most isolated communities are becoming even more so with the compounding realities and effects of climate change. 
If you are a resident of Marin City or the Canal District, of which I know there are a few here today, you are already living in the reality of rising water and regular flooding and environmental degradation. Marin City, predominantly and historically a African American community, is Marin County's ground zero for flooding. Having already been constructed on a historical flood zone, it is now at the center of a perfect climate storm, resulting in an all too common situation where thousands of residents are literally stranded in their communities because of unusual rain rainfall events or king tides, sometimes without electricity because they are surrounded by rising floodwaters. Another community at the center of this perfect storm is the Canal District in San Rafael. FEMA has already described this area and the area around it stretching all the way to the downtown corridor in danger of increasing flooding. The reality of rising seas threatens a relatively new mass transit site, a water treatment plant, municipal waste transfer station, and critical spans of Highway 580 and 101. But let's be clear here. All of this critical infrastructure can and likely will be replaced for a city like San Rafael. But for the hundreds of homes in the Canal District, homes for families individual and individuals that cannot afford to rebuild and they cannot afford today to pick up and relocate to higher ground, what will happen to these communities? So let me ask you now, am I being a bummer yet? <laughs> so here's the thing, just because we can be conscious aware and truthful about what is happening with climate doesn't mean that we should be hopeless. I think hope and fear are binary. You cannot have one actually without the other. But just as we cannot have light without darkness, I believe there is an essential correlation. And I believe in this correlation because I have experienced it so personally over the last several years. In the midst of our collective despair around our democracy, we had a record number of voters come out, show up in many cases for the first time, to vote, to register their voices, and to be counted. In the wrenching despair over the murders, harassment, and intimidation of black people in the United States, which, make no mistake about it, has always happened in the history of the United States. The collective reckoning that has resulted in a transformative and concrete progress that is more progress than I could have ever even imagined in my lifetime. And in the face of catastrophe, disaster, and ruin, we see hope. Hope are the seeds that germinate because of this fire. We should not be having a conversation about mitigation versus adaptation. We need to do both. And by doing both, we can further the urgent and necessary cause of climate action. So let me be clear about what I think this means for our area, this county, and these communities. Yes, we need to do everything we can to push our electeds to further climate policy. Yes, we need to do everything we can to find more solutions to mitigate the carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions that Marin County admits. This includes better transportation systems, better agricultural practices, more electri electrification policies and platforms for homes and cars. It means more access for all to renewable sources of energy. It means more advocacy and support for our representatives on every level of our government to prioritize and push this agenda forward. But it also means that the difference that you can make is more than individual action around consumption or political action. The individual action that I believe in my gut, in my core, that is the action that is needed today is action around uniting our communities around, and here's the punchline, our communities. I am not sure who actually coined the term think global, act local, but whomever it should be should be as rich as Elon Musk. Because it's brilliant actually in terms of the action on the place where you live, on the opportunities before you. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the place where the leverage of all of the great shifts in society has ever come from. It is today, it has always been that case. So let's focus on place. And let's focus what we can do in our corner of the world to make things better. So what do we do now? Well, we need each and every one of you to take a step towards helping someone else in our community that needs help. Someone who stands up to speak truth to power. Someone who channels their fear into hope by connecting with real people every day. Heroes, activists, organizers, hands, hearts, bodies that are simply standing up and doing what is necessary right now. What we need is each other. And how can you help your neighbors? How can you get engaged in the suffering that is already occurring in our communities and in our neighborhoods? Well, we can begin to talk about climate action in terms of climate justice by fo focusing equally, again, on the efforts that will help mitigate suffering. So let's stand up and walk into these communities and ask people themselves, what do you need help with? What can we do now to help the residents of Marin City and the Canal District? What do they need now? How can we show up and ask them these questions? How can we donate our time and energy and resources to engaging in actions that directly help our neighbors? For the young people in the room, um, and I'm super excited to hear from you later, how can you mobilize your friends and your classmates to be engaged in a movement that focuses on helping our own communities? How can you utilize your savvy with social media connect, to connect each other across high schools and middle schools in this county? And how can each and every one of you become the Greta Thornburgs, leading your own protest, not alone, but with community? So again, I ask all of you to channel your hope into concretely and tangibly doing something that literally can change the lives of someone in our communities today. If you don't know what to do, again, reach out directly and ask, because I guarantee you, the folks in those communities will have an answer. So to conclude, climate change has always seemed overwhelmingly daunting, abstract, too massive to know how to solve, too global to have reasonable mechanisms to rely upon. And I am here today, after working for more than three decades on environmental and climate issues, to tell you that it's actually less daunting, it's less abstract or overwhelming. The solutions are here, and they're actually right here in this very room today. So get active, get involved, get hope by doing something tangible that improves the conditions for those already living with climate change. And despite all odds, humanity at its best has always bent the arc of justice, uh, the arc of history towards justice. But it doesn't happen on its own. We each need to stand up and reach up to take that share of our responsibility to bend this arc for our community and for our world. Thank you very much. As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. The day she gets her first pet, there are thousands of newly extinct species she'll never meet. The night she forgets to call, the night of her first heartbreak, her future home floods for the first of many times. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it.
Rhea, that was wonderful. Thank you for your words. And that just breaks my heart every time, so I'm just going to be a clump for a moment here. Um, while these guys come up, um, that is such a powerful, short, one-minute video that just lays it out. Um, and this first session is called A Bright Green Future. Come on up, you guys. Hi, Una. So four high school students are joining us this morning, and I will let the moderator introduce them, but first I get to introduce him. Trevor Cohen grew up in Marin and went to high school here in San Rafael. We were introduced last summer and were asked to interview each other for a magazine article. Trevor was taking an AP environmental science course way back when, when Al Gore's first climate film came out, An Inconvenient Truth, and that was 2006. As he told me last summer, that movie really freaked him out. He said, it was clear that if we didn't, do, didn't start doing something immediately, the consequences would be dire. Through both education and action, he saw a glimpse of what a sustainable future might look like, and that it was possible to reinvent our relationship with the planet. That period in his high school career set him on the path that he is on today. Trevor is an environmental author and educator who travels the country to chronicle a renaissance in empowering communities and healing the planet. He's a really nice guy too. His book, Bright Green Future, brings together stories of innovators and activists who are building the foundation of a sustainable society. Readers will learn, his book by the way is over there, and it's for sale and he'll sign it for you. Um, readers will learn what symbiotic relationships can teach us about switching to renewables, how ecosystems can guide the next industrial revolution, and how the hidden genius of rainforests and prairies can help us grow food in a warming world. I couldn't think of a better person to moderate this session with these four students. Welcome Trevor Cohen and you four wonderful humans. Well, thank you, Leslie, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here and thrilled to be with these wonderful young climate solutionaries and young activists. Um, in this session, we're going to hear from young activists, solutionaries, and communicators in Marin. They're working to push the proverbial boulder of climate action and social change. And you'll get a chance near the end of this session to ask questions to them yourselves, so start thinking of those during our discussion. Before we begin, let's see a show of hands. How many of you, how many of you knew what climate change was when you were in high school? Okay, yeah, a, a few here, yeah. I, I would say that has completely reversed now, <laughs> 100%, 180. Um, and how many of you, I know maybe climate change wasn't, am I getting some feedback on this? Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Um, I know climate change might not have been as big when you were, uh, when, when some of us were growing up, but how many, let's get also a show of hands, how many of you were active at least in some environmental capacity in high school at that age? Okay, wow, actually a few more. That, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, you can see my hand in my pocket right now. Um, I, I'm guilty. I was, I was not as active as, so, as a lot of the young folks are right now, and it's, it's truly it's inspiring to see that generation. Um, you know, if climate change and the many social challenges that intersect it that we're facing now have any upside, it's that it's transformed Generation Z into basically a generation of superheroes. They're quite possibly the new greatest generation as they rise to the occasion to tackle some of the, quite possibly some of the greatest challenges of our time. And it's not just climate change, there's so many different in issues that intersect with climate change that we need to address. 
And the way that they're thinking about it um, is light years ahead of where I was at their age. And, you know, as a millennial, they're, they're kind of like that younger sibling that could already do everything better than I could. <laughs> Am I jealous? Uh, maybe a little. Am I impressed? Heck yeah, I am. <laughs> this generation inspires all of us to up our game, to do better, because the alternative is just not an option. Over the last few weeks, I had the privilege of talking to these four young change makers. Harita Kalvai is a junior at the Marin School of Environmental Leadership at Terra Linda. She runs youth social engagement and outreach for Citizens Climate Lobby, an organization of tens of thousands of members that's working to put a tax on carbon. Sarah Mondesir, a junior also at the Marin School of Environmental Leadership, is interested in exploring the uneven effects of climate change on people of color and is currently writing a book known as Flavor Profiles that highlights the lives of black folks killed by police by using humanizing stories combined with food recipes from black cooks. Meredith Foster, a junior at St. Ignatius, works directly with city officials and local leaders to help shape Corte Madera's climate action plan. Una Clark, a senior at San Domenico, organizes and presents at events with Sunrise and the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit that bring together hundreds of young climate activists. They are passionate about making the nitty gritty of climate science accessible to all. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, or sorry, that's too close to home. <laughs> sorry, the, the milt of the glacier, no, sorry. What I mean to say is a snapshot of the many projects and work that these fantastic young people all do. Um, so my first question to you all here is, um, what was it that first inspired you to do something about climate change or get involved in tackling some of the greatest challenges of our time? So feel free to jump in. <laughs> you want to go first? Um, I can go first. I think, like, really my experience growing up in Marin, um, both of my parents, they're immigrants from Haiti and they came to America. And so I feel like growing up, I was deprived of certain things. I wasn't able to like afford the same things. And I also was living in a space where there wasn't really a, a lot of black people around me also. I was like the one black kid at like, I don't know, like a predominantly white or Hispanic school. And so I did face a lot of racism and I did face a lot of issues, but through that I found my passion toward, for social justice. I realized I want to change the way everybody looks at each other. And so through that, I also ended up finding Marin Cell because my oldest sister was a part of the program too. And so my mom basically, she said, you need to sign up for this program. This is what you need to do. I need you to be ready for like high school, like this is what you're gonna do. So it wasn't my first choice, but I'm glad, I'm, not that it's bad or anything, I'm glad that she like kind of gave me that little shove, like she pushed me into that environment because I did grow a lot as a person and I was able to learn so much more about the environment and about the people around me. Thank you for that, Sarah. <laughs> I can go next. Um, so I go to San Domenico High School, which is the first independent school in California. And um, one of San Domenico's kind of like core missions that they always talk about um, is a service. And it's one of their like three core values. Um, and so when I got to San Domenico as a freshman, um, I was really expecting that to be a big part of the school community. And in a lot of ways it was. Um, the Social Justice Club is one of the oldest clubs on campus, um, and that's really cool. But one of the things that I noticed when I got there, and I was really shocked by it, was um, that there wasn't really any leading environmental club. And to be honest, there still isn't. The green team is not super active on campus, but um, it kind of became my mission to change that about the school, and at least within my community and with my friends. Um, and my dad is a teacher at Archie Williams High School, 
and has been there for many, many years. And so he has had a lot of contact with a lot of um, different climate activists that have come through Marin before. And he gave me the contact of somebody named Rose Strauss who um, was in Sunrise. And I ended up just reaching out to her. And that kind of um, like kickstarted me going into that. And now um, there have been a lot of student action from my school. And I'm really happy one of the things that was really important to me um, was working with the administration to make it more easy for um, students at my school to like go to climate strikes. And so um, that was, I was really happy about that. And the new, uh, our Dean of Students um, uh, has made it so that now like they can have excused absences and even um, wanted to work with me. It was <laughs> if you were the COVID, but to be able to, because we have boarding students as well, to be able to like uh, provide transport to those things for students to go, which I was really happy about. And so slowly but surely, um, that sort of has been changing at my school, which has been really important to me. And I'm really glad that I kind of took that step and was able to do that. Thank you, Una. <laughs> um, my name is Harita Kalvai. I am a junior in Marin Cell. And honestly, at first, I didn't think I would be super passionate about climate activism, which is funny because look where I am right now. <laughs> um, because I saw it as this super scientific issue. And I didn't really see it as something that could affect someone like me or affect somebody <laughs> around me because I didn't really see climate change as an issue that was a big deal right now. I saw it as something that would happen in the future, something that impacts would only hit the world once I was gone. And once I started thinking about the fact that, oh, this is really something that's happening right now, I wanted to think about the way that it affected people in different groups. Um, so similar to Sarah, I do a lot of work around looking at how climate change might affect different ethnic groups or different cultural groups. Um, and also looking at climate change through an art perspective by incorporating different elements of art into activism to teach people that climate change isn't only a scientific issue, but also an issue that affects people as well. Thank you, Harita. Um, my name is Meredith Foster. Um, so my family has been going to the Oregon coast every summer. Uh, we love it up there. I love nature. I love exploring the natural world. And um, ever since I was little, I would see all of these colorful starfish on the rocks by the beach. And every year, I started to see less and less. I was still a pretty little kid, but even I noticed that the biodiversity was declining. Then one year, we noticed there were basically no starfish at all. My dad and I were really concerned. What's going on? So we did some research, and it turns out around 2013, there was something called starfish wasting disease. There was a huge outbreak on the Pacific coast. And impacts changes to the environment, including the marine environment, with changes like ocean acidification, rising global temperatures, and glo global ocean temperatures specifically, are what cause the bacteria behind this disease. And considering you know, the changes to our environment, changes to biodiversity, that really just touched my heart, even as a little kid. And then today, seeing our almost annual global uh, or almost annual California wildfires, being able to see that with your own eyes, see the starfish going, see the you know the land burning, that is what really um, motivated me, drove home the importance of action for the climate. Um, and so I've been looking for ways to get involved in my local community. And so back in 2020, before, right before the pandemic. I joined my town's uh, climate action committee, and that's been such a meaningful experience to be able to work, as was said in our keynote, at the local level to really drive this change. Thank you, Meredith. So Harita and Meredith, you both have experience working with people who are a few generations ahead of you. How can climate initiatives that are led by folks a few decades your senior, create a welcoming environment for young people? Um, can, can I start? Oh yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> I think that one thing that these organizations need to do is find good ways to reach out to youth. Um, and I'm lucky to be part of Citizens Climate Lobby where they did reach out to youth directly and they did really want to hear our voices. So I would honestly say that the best way to create a welcoming environment is to just be willing to listen um, youth have a lot of interesting perspectives that 
some people might not even think about, and everybody's experiences are so different. So just being willing to listen to people is really the first step to getting someone involved. Thank you. I would completely agree. Um, and each, every generation you know, has its insights, but also its blind spots. So the willingness to listen is so crucial um, because young people really can bring so much to this movement. We uh, are able to connect with like, a new demographic and just connect the climate movement to the future and future generations. Um, I've been really lucky in my experience on my Town Climate Action Committee. Um, all the adults have listened and they've um, helped connect me to uh, leadership roles in my community where I can make a difference in connecting with students. I lead student outreach for my committee and uh, we just kicked off a student ambassador program that connects our um, committee's uh, climate action uh, outreach to student communities. Again, seeing students as change makers and leaders and an inspiration to all of us. So yeah, you really pointed out well that each generation really has a unique wisdom to offer. As young people, what advice would you give to other generations on addressing the climate crisis as well as the many social challenges that we face? Um, I think like a really good advice is just to make sure that you make it clear you're there to support. Because people don't want to feel as though um, you're almost like their savior. They don't, that's, I feel like a lot of people, they aren't looking for that. A lot of people are very independent, especially during this time. And especially for young kids like us, we don't like being told what to do. Like I know when my mom <laughs> tells me to clean my room, I don't want to do it just because she told me. But I feel like something that we should all learn how to do is how to make sure, like they have mentioned before, to hear each other, but also to see each other. We need to look at each other like we're equals, not as if like we're like the teacher and then they're the student. We have to look at each other like um, you're like a human being and I'm a human being. And I feel like if we continue to have that perspective, if we continue to like communicate and work that way, we're going to get a lot of things done. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I can sort of add on to that. that um, I think that something that's really important to remember is that you know this is an issue that affects all of us. It doesn't matter where you're from, or how wealthy you are, or you know what you know status you may have in you know the government or whatever, wherever you are. Um, at some point, it's going to catch up to you. And so we really kind of need to all take care of each other, just like um, the keynote speaker was saying, that's really important because, you know, maybe you can get away from it for a little bit, but at some point, like, it's not gonna be enough. And this is something that we all need to pay attention to and um, help to stop because, yeah, it, it's gonna affect all of us. Thank you, Una. We all have a common stake in this, and just recognizing that each of us can serve as an, set an example for our community in terms of the sustainable choices we're making, really these simple acts as a collect collectively can have such an impact. Just going about, you know, reevaluating your daily life, your, your lifestyle, and saying, okay, how can I make this more, how can I be more green? Um, what am I consuming? What products am I using? What are they packaged in? What food am I eating? How am I getting to the places I need to be? How can I change what I'm driving? Or if I'm not gonna drive, how can I bike or walk? Just continuing to ask these questions, having this mindset of experimentation and really just uh, aiming for solutions, however, um, whatever, uh, going for the you know, accessible things, the simple things, and really setting an example for the people um, in your family, in your, in your community as well. Thank you, Meredith. I'd just like to add one final note, um, and that's that every age group has their own strengths and weaknesses, so we really need to learn how to utilize those strengths and weaknesses in any way that we can. You know, just because a member of the youth might not have as much experience in climate activism as someone older might have, doesn't mean that they don't still have valuable experiences that might be interesting to put on the table. So it really is important to listen to everybody because everybody has something that they can share. Thank you for that, Harita. And on that note, Una, in our conversation, you mentioned how young people might feel completely overwhelmed by climate change, 
that the weight of the world is on your shoulder, how, what, what advice would you give to young people to help them get involved and find a way to be part of climate action? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, and my answer is definitely for young people, but also for everybody in this room. It applies to everybody. Um, so, but before I, I answer that, I want to say something quick. Um, do you, does anybody here know what greenwashing is? Yeah, okay, great. So um, something that I find happens a lot in um, when like environmental conversations is especially a lot of companies who are big contributors to the climate crisis will often try to put on a facade of being sustainable or put the blame on us as consumers, when in reality, it's usually on them um, for trying to make ways that they can make more money in the easiest way possible, which is usually pretty bad for both humans and the environment. Um, and uh, I think there was just a report that was just released where consumers voted like Amazon as one of the most sustainable companies, <laughs> which is um, a little bit shocking to me. But yeah, so I just want to say that um, to that point, they really like to put the blame on us and like, what can you do? Like, you're not vegan, it's your fault. Like, that's not true, okay? It's not your fault. And none of us in this room have to be 100% perfect. And I think that that is something, the idea that we have to be completely perfect and have to be Greta Thunberg, you know, like up there leading these global marches with hundreds of thousands of people or like completely denounce um, all like meat and dairy products and then like only drive electric vehicles or like only bike to work, like that's not attainable for all of us, you know? And um, you, don't, you don't have to be that. What, what's really going to make a difference is just doing a little thing, like maybe, one day uh, you decide not to eat meat, or one day like students in high school can you know, go to a public comment at, um, you know, to, to share their thoughts with the local government, or go to the climate strike, or just say to their principal, like, hey, like, maybe we shouldn't be using these plastic cups. Um, I know that's something that my school has done a lot of. We finally got rid of them. Um, they're paper cups, but they're lined with plastic, and so you know they don't actually um, make a difference. So we finally got rid of them, and now everybody has to bring their own mugs to school, which is really great. And that's one little small change, but it does make a difference, especially if all of us do that. So that is really my biggest piece: is like don't feel intimidated. Just do what you can, and know that if everybody does that, it will be enough. Thank you, Anna. Sarah. You've thought very deeply on this and are working on projects that challenge us to move beyond stories of just tragedy and victimhood to celebrate the lives and humanity of people like Breonna Taylor. Why is it important to celebrate our humanity and our good human qualities in response to the many crises we face, including climate change? Mm -hmm. I think that celebrating our humanity is so, so important. It's 2022. We have a lot of people dying. Climate change is literally getting worse. And I feel like if we focus so much on the negativity and if we just only say, oh my gosh, you're gonna die or like you're not gonna have a future or so something like that, like we would end up losing each other and like losing our own way. We're going to start hating each other. We're going to start arguing a lot more. I know to me, like right now, it seems like some days the world is moving forward, but then other days like the world is moving backwards. Like we're making change, but also we are stopping the change. And I feel like with so many new laws and with so many new things that are happening, like women can't have full control of their bodies or people can't have the liberty to talk about racism, to talk about how they feel, how they identify. I feel like that really sets us apart. And so it's really important to also be like, yes, of course, these things are happening, but guess what these group of, pe of people are doing? Like, look at this room. You guys are here together for one thing, to talk about climate change, to think of new solutions. And I feel like we should also like celebrate that and uplift that so then people know it's not like all like gloom and doom. Like, I feel like people need to understand there's like good and bad, not just bad, but there's also like good. Thank you for that, Sarah. So there are so many different ways to be part of the solution of climate change. Everything from being a communicator, um, to working on conservation work, to working on social justice projects, 
um, to farming and gardening and there's just really so many ways to be part of this renaissance of healing the, the planet and empowering our own communities from the bottom up. Um, what roles in that, in this kind of movement, really appeal to you all here? Um, that could either be stuff you're doing now or careers that call to you in the future. Um, I could talk. <laughs> Um, because I'm really excited about one thing. I heard that you, um, Ms. Tsa, I think, um, worked for the NRDC, and that made me really excited because that's kind of my dream job. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm, um, I'm a senior right now, so I've been applying to colleges, and um, yeah, I've heard that one of them might be giving us <laughs> their decision today. So yeah, March is a little bit of a stressful month, but I'm really excited. Um, I really hope to study climate science. And, and then go on to do law, because I really think that that is um, something important. Um, and I, Trevor mentioned this at the beginning, uh, sort of what one of my main things is uh, making science, like the science of climate change, really understandable for people. I feel like a lot of um, young people especially don't really understand why climate change is happening or like why it's important and they're like, oh, I know that this is an issue and so like I want to support it because I know it affects me. But like I've asked them like, do you know about this or about that? And they're like, no, I don't really understand that. And so that's something that's really important to me is like really like getting down and like walking people through it like this and this and this. And I'm taking AP Environmental Science this year Imagine that Trevor did that too, and I think that's a great class, definitely for um, high schoolers to take, because it really goes into all that, and, and also the history of, of um, climate activism. It, it goes over a lot of um, like old uh, proposals that were passed and movements that happened. I think that's really important. Thank you, Una. Um, I love science. I I think I curiosity is something that is really matters to me. I just I love asking questions, especially as it relates to nature and conservation. So I think I'm, I'm not decided yet on a specific career, but I know I want to go into some kind of research, whether it's uh, scientific or policy research. I think um, just staying curious and really getting to the root of some of these problems and how to solve them. So, Thank you, Meredith. Um, I think for me, like I'm really, I, although I'm in Marin Cell, I feel as though there's still so much that I need to learn because growing up, I've mainly been focusing on like you know, racism and addressing that. But then now I'm at a point where I'm trying to see how I can intersect these two big ideas into these two worlds because there is a lot of intersection. Um, for a career <laughs> in the future, I feel like, like in some cases, like I do want to be a lawyer or maybe go into criminal justice and stuff. But then I feel like I'm going to be restricted by certain things. I won't be able to move as freely to really like reach out to different communities on a personal level and my goal, main goal in the future is to make sure that like I can still create change but also work with groups of people like I want to be the person that's like going to food banks or that's going to different events I want to be the person that's hosting these things bringing community together so I'm just trying to decide like which is the perfect like path like where should I go and so I'm still on that journey of figuring it out but I know I really want to go into social justice thank you Sarah and I, I have a controversial take I don't know if everybody will agree with this but I feel as though, you know, we have all of the science that we need. We have all of the data to back up, obviously, that climate change is a real issue. We have all of the data to back up that things are going to get worse and things are going to keep getting worse, as pessimistic as that sounds. And we also have all of the research done in order to mitigate the climate crisis as much as we can. So right now, I believe that one of the things that we still need to do is create policies um, and create ways for people in power to support people rather than support corporations. Um, Una, as you said earlier, you know, corporations, they're the ones who are really causing all of these huge issues. It's not individual people. Like this climate crisis is not your fault. It's the fault of people who are in power and who are abusing that power. So thinking about that, when I grow up, I really want to go into politics, maybe go into law, um, and I want to help create policies that you know, um, can regulate this huge issue. Thank you for that, Harita. And 
that also leads me to my next question for you, Harita. Um, as you pointed out, climate change is often so equated with science, but you've really brought art and poetry into the equation. In what ways does art play a role in climate policy, action, and solutions? Well, I think that art takes, can take something super abstract and turn it into something human and super intimate. Um, and I want to use art as a way to show people that climate change is something that's affecting everyone right now. More importantly, it's something that's affecting you right now. Um, and art is also something that can really move people. I write a lot of poetry and I am very involved in music. And I have learned that something as simple as playing a song or reciting a poem can really move somebody. So I want to be able to use those different mediums as well as visual art to really help move people and impact them in, on a personal level. Thank you for that, Harita. <laughs> and your, your project sounds really cool around, um, what, what does it ask people to do? So I am doing a, an art campaign called The Future We Create, and I'll be doing two exhibits one on April 16th at the E14 Gallery in Oakland, and one on April 24th at the Mill Valley Community Center. And I've been asking youth from all over the country to show me what they think the world will look like in 50 years. And I've gotten all types of submissions, art, poetry, sculpture, short film, and even music production. And I've noticed that a lot of the, um, the submissions that I've been getting from youth are pretty pessimistic. Um, which is to be expected from youth, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's just really interesting to look at that. And I've also been getting submissions not only from teenagers, but also from little kids from the ages of, of like maybe five to 11. And I've noticed that all of their submissions have been really optimistic. <laughs> so seeing all of these little kids be super optimistic <laughs> about what the world is going to look like and seeing all of these teenagers being really pessimistic has really you know, impacted me because it's made me realize that we treat climate change as if we can't do anything about it and as if there isn't a solution when there definitely is. And that's what I want to show people through this exhibit. Thank you, Harita. <laughs> so my final question to you all is, and this is a big one, what do you want the future to look like when your hypothetical children are in high school? <laughs> um, I would like to be older first, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I think, like, if I were to have kids in, in high school, I would want them to be in a program like Marin Cell, because we are literally exposed to so many new activities, so many new things. Like, we literally start um, doing these big projects since, like at the start of freshman year. And right now we're in our like business segment, so we have the opportunity to like um, honestly produce our own business. And I feel like that's such a gift, so I would like to make sure that like my kids would be living in a space where there's um, programs like Marin Cell and also a space that's very diverse and that's welcoming and that's there to really support like my my children i guess like i feel like sometimes being a high school student you feel alone and you feel so lost like i'm a junior and i'm about to like apply to college soon and like sometimes i feel like there's this like struggle um there's like this battle trying to figure out where do i want to go what do i want to do i feel like i need to grow up and like i really need to do something big but i feel like i want them to feel so they have that support and that they are going to have people around the, around them to like you know make them feel safe and comfortable yeah. thank you sarah um so um like harita i'm also really interested in politics and I don't know how many of you know what the Junior States of America is, but um, I'm the president of my school's chapter and politics have always been a really big passion for me. Um, and so I hope that something that we, the people of the United States, if you will, <laughs> um, uh, can sort of strive to change is a little bit how our democracy functions because I think a lot of us can agree that it is quite broken right now. Um, and we just go back and forth and back and forth between you know Democrat and Republican, and it doesn't really do anything. 
um, and progress is very slow. Um, and you know, George Washington said that a two-party system would be the downfall of America, and I think we're kind of seeing that <laughs> um, right now. You know, we had the Trump administration and the Biden administration, and although you know they are vastly different, there are also a lot of things about them that aren't very different. Um, and I really think that we need to get better as a country of um, understanding that like collaboration is important and really just trying to fix those two polarizing sides. And I don't think that, you know, the world isn't black and white. There shouldn't just be two choices. That's not how it works. Um, and so that's one thing that I really hope can change in the future, because if it continues on like this, we're not going to be able to fix anything. Thank you, Una. I would hope that by the time, if I had a kid in high school, there would be no more denial on the science behind climate change, because that's still such a polarizing thing. Um, I would hope that we have kind of a fundamental shift in terms of how we view um, our role as sort of caretakers of the planet. We have a common stake in this, so we have a common responsibility. And I would hope that that you know, mindset shift would also be visible in our infrastructure, um, making you know, more walkable cities and uh, just generally turning away from fossil fuels by then, um, and which would both contribute to greater world peace around conflicts around fossil fuels, as well as just have healthier people, like uh, air pollution and other issues of environmental justice often stem from that uh, use of fossil fuels. And then finally, I would hope that although today's conversations are so important, I would hope that my high schooler would not have to talk about this. I would hope <laughs> that they would not have to have urgent conversations on climate change as a kid, because that's, not, that's something no kid should have to worry about, and yet here we are today. So that, that's my hope for the future. I would say I have two hopes for the future. Um, the first thing is that I hope that high schoolers in the future have a chance to do more project-based learning like we do in Marin Cell, just because I feel like that has really helped me grow passionate about something. Taking tests and doing busy work all day does not help you become passionate about something, but really getting in there and really learning things and getting to do things firsthand does. Um, so I want, my hope is, that, sorry, my hope is for that everybody has the chance to do something like that. And the second thing is that I would hope that high schoolers in the future will be able to use public transit that's efficient. Um, we don't necessarily have the best and most efficient public transportation system right now, and a lot of people would really benefit from that, specifically people who don't have their own personal form of transportation. So having a system where people can use public transportation or walk to places and it's much easier in the future is definitely something that I would like to see. Thank you, Harita. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Leslie, could we get a quick time check? Yes, 9.45. 9.45, perfect, yeah. perfect. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have my watch, so. Um, wonderful. So we'll now open up the discussion for questions from the audience. Um, if you want to raise your hand, we will very quickly dispatch a mic runner to amplify your voice. Can we get a mic? Anyway, I, I, I was literally bowled over by the passion and the common sense. Uh, <laughs> That it was good. I, I was just curious, though, if any of you had ever heard of something called the public trust doctrine. Um, it's a law, and it's always been a law. It's been the law all along while we've been making all this mess and stuff, but it's, it, it's older than the United States and our democracy, and it uh, came from when there was an emperor. And there are some things emperors can't give away. <laughs> and anyway, uh, th that some things are so important for public use, they can't be treated like private property. And um, that's very important for this, you know, the whole idea of collaboration. And I, I was just, you know, it's lawyers who uh, are trying to get rid of it. And I'm just hoping that um, that the in inspiration of it 
could be a real help because it's, it's really an important law. And we are all in this together, and it's always been the law. And uh, any, I, I'm just uh, hoping that that's part of the high school thing. Thanks, Thank Michael. Looks like we got a question over here. Hi, thanks, you guys. I'm totally blown what's, away by. What's your name, by the way? Oh, sorry, Carlene Cullen. Hi. Thanks, uh, Totally blown away by all of you. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, corporate, some of you touched upon corporations and the greenwashing and what's happening. Um, and I'm kind of curious as to what you all think solutions are, approaches to that issue um, that could really you know, have a lot of impact. Um, um, I think a big one is um, sort of stronger international laws and collaboration between countries. Because one thing that is a problem right now is, you know, the United States does, definitely doesn't have strict enough laws, in my opinion, on environmental regulations. But we do have some. Um, and when we pass those laws, a lot of corporations, especially like this is a big issue in the um, fashion industry, um, or, or even like in electronics, um, like we'll source different materials from outside. Uh, they'll go outside the United States into countries that don't have the same laws and the same regulations. Um, and so they can go and you know, have their factories and pollute or exploit labor there and don't have to face the consequences, but then they can still sell their products in the United States, which doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I feel like if we have these laws here, then we should be upholding it with so, uh, products that are sold here as well. Um, otherwise, what's the point of <laughs> making the laws in the first place? So that's definitely a big one um, for me there. Yeah. Thank you, Una. Well, thank you. I'm Bruce Ackerman, and I just wanted to offer you all my thanks, my gratitude for all the wisdom that you've given us and offer you a bit of encouragement because I feel your pain. You've all mentioned the, the struggle at this point in your life. I remember it so well uh, of trying to figure out what am I going to do? What path am I going to take? There are so many paths and they all connect with each other. And so it's just a nonsensical decision to figure out what I'm going to think about for the entire rest of my life. And I just wanted to say <laughs> that you don't actually have to. If you listen, <laughs> for example, to that beautiful introduction for Ria So today, that just listen to all the things that she's been involved in. And that's what gives the strength is the, the fact that you learn from one thing and you take that to the next thing. And that's the way life is more and more. So I just wanted to give you that encouragement that you're all going to do really fine. And, and <laughs> OK, not, not a question, but that was a very nice sentiment. <laughs> Any other? OK. Hey, everyone. My name is Jessica. I want to start off by thanking the panelists for their time. I know as young people that are you know, shaping your futures, it took a lot for you to be here and shape our futures and create this vision together. Um, and a few of you touched on this, on you know, your identities and exploitation. And one question that I have for you all, if you feel comfortable digging into this, is for those of you that identify as young women, what overlaps do you see with the um, gender identity and the exploitation of women and environmental issues? And what solutions do you propose um, to combat that, if you can? Thank you. I can start off, if that's OK. Um, and I just wanted to touch on what you said, actually, Una, um, about corporations and there being um, issues with doing any international work, because the laws aren't as strict, and um, there aren't as many regulations. And one thing that I've seen and definitely read about a lot is how young women constantly get exploited in the fashion industry. Um, they have to do a lot of cheap labor. They don't even get paid at all. And child labor is a huge issue. Um, and most of the people working in these factories are young women, maybe between the ages of like 10 to 20, which is insane to me. Um, I would definitely say that internationally, exploiting women to do all of this cheap labor, um, that is just environmentally awful, is a huge issue. And I think that that definitely needs to be resolved. Thank you, Harita. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'll have to agree with what Harita said. 
And also something I want to say is that like being a black woman, I like sometimes I feel as though my identity as a woman is stripped away. It comes second. And what comes first is like my race. So being black, I feel like people, um, sometimes I feel like I get masculinized and sometimes I feel like people don't really look at me as like a woman. And it is really hard and it is really frustrating, but I feel like what motivated me to be in this work, to be in this space, is seeing women like literally on TV or just hearing speakers like in 2020, like I feel like watching them speak up and talk about these issues has motivated me to not only feel confident with what I say, but who I am. Um, I feel like feeling confident with who you are and seeing representation really matters. It's really helpful because I feel like maybe like as I was growing up, I didn't see a black woman. I didn't see women of color up on stage. I mainly saw white women. And like, I, I really like appreciate all the work that they have done, but I couldn't relate to them in the same way I was able to relate to a woman of color. And so I feel like making sure that there's women who look like me, who don't look like me, who come from, who have different backgrounds and who may be a part of the LGBTQ community also is really important because then other people will be able to stand up and find their voice and maybe be on stage one day also. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, my name is Silver Clark, uh, same last name, Ona. Um, <laughs> but uh, I live in Fairfax, California, near Archie Williams High School, and they are gathering petitions to, go, to get solar panels installed on their roof of the school. And they're the only high school in, uh, they're only, only school in Ross Valley system that doesn't have solar panels. So I've, I've been on your campus, San Domenico mm -hmm. campus a lot, and I've never seen solar panels. Oh. Are, do, they, do they have them? Yeah, is that yeah we do. Um, cool. We have a really large campus, so I'm not surprised you haven't seen them. But um, yeah, they're uh, like in the back of the campus on the hills, and we actually do use them a lot. Um, they, they have significantly lowered like the cost of electricity. Of course, we don't completely rely on them, but they can be really helpful during power outages. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we do. We have big solar panels there. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. how about the other schools that, um, I don't know about your high schools. So they have solar panels on your school. And is that something that you would uh, like to get adults in? Um, my school's green team. Oh, sorry. My school's green team is pretty active, and that is one issue we've been working on. Um, our school, I the the school administration has been kind of unclear, honestly, about uh, the issue of solar panels and schools' electricity. We've mainly been focusing on things like food waste. We have a um, like community garden right next door to our school, so that's been the main um, focus of my school's green team. But um, solar panels are definitely something we've been talking to the administration on for several years. And honestly, it's been put on the back burner because of COVID. But um, I think that is definitely something we need to continue to work on. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Rebecca Rothman here. Uh, and I had a question on empowering action and specifically your perspective on what empowers your peers to act. Um, and if you have any insights on that, I'd love to hear it. Thanks. Yeah, I can start. Um, for me, something that's really just empowered me a lot is seeing other young people doing all of this fantastic work um, and seeing people my age going out and doing things in their community. And I think that you know, most high schoolers feel this way. When they see somebody their age who's out there doing all of these amazing things, they want to be a part of it too. Um, so I feel like I'm most motivated by, um, by activists, youth activists, who are out in their communities making a big difference. By seeing them, um, it just makes me more motivated to go out and do the same thing. Thank you, Harita. Um, here. I'm, I'm Rich Storek, and uh, I'm an architect, but I'm here representing the Canal Arts, which is a coalition of 14 marine organizations, 
all dedicated to promoting and creating public art in the canal in East San Rafael. We've been, for years, we've been sponsoring interns from MCEL, and in the next few days, we'll be interviewing a few more, and I want to talk to some of you. <laughs> but I want to say this, that for the, seeing the four of you, what I am seeing is the hundreds of thousands like you that stand behind you. You are a multitude, and we're here in your gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Hi, I'm Bridget Clark, and I thank you so much for your inspiration. Um, a quick question. As a parent, um, I have heard, and maybe you can um, look into this, um, that San Domenico uh, reuses their graduation gowns. And I've always been curious, because at the other schools, they don't do that. And having had two kids that graduate, you know, we have these gowns, they're not reused and it's just a simple thing that I've thought about so you're inspiring me to ask and you know I'm just curious if that's something that um, you've heard about and that maybe we could as a community think about. Um, I actually had not heard that <laughs> but I'm not surprised. Um, my school, uh, I mean for a long time we were an all-girls school and we also used to have uniforms um, and I know that we did reuse uniforms so we had a uniform closet um, and people would take them and then give them back. And um, so it doesn't surprise me at all that graduation gowns are also something that has been reused um, in the past. I, I do think that COVID changed that a little bit. Uniforms, um, that, that's been changing. Uniforms have been phased out. I've never worn them in the high school. They were phased out the year before I got there. <coughs> but um, I think that's a great idea. Certainly more schools should be doing that with something that people literally only wear once. Also along that line, um, I really think there needs to be a better way for um, people to like donate or sell their prom dresses for people who like maybe <laughs> it's less accessible because like I know I'm probably only going to wear this dress once and why would I, you know, why would I want to keep it or just throw it away? Um, so yeah, for those types of things, there really should be a, a better way that each school is kind of focusing on making sure that they can be reused in that way. That's a great question. Thank you, Una. Great. Well, thank you all for all of your amazing questions. Um, can we give it up for these amazing panelists? Come on, come on. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming and hearing their various stories and actions they're working on. Um, we'll now have a break for the next 15 minutes. Um, feel free to check out all the different tables of people who in, in our community who are working on different climate solutions, um, as well as definitely check out this booth over here to make your climate pledge. We'll have a camera there where you can take a picture of your pledge. Don't worry, it's just you know a small non-binding commitment that uh, has to do with the fate of humanity for the next few thousand years. But I guarantee you that your great, 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 great grandchildren will still be thanking, of, thanking you for that pledge. Um, and then lastly, we will also have, I have my book over there, Bright Green Future, if you're interested in a signed copy from yours truly, um, as well as we have a sign-up sheet if you're interested in pre-ordering uh, Sarah's book, Flavor Profiles, I would highly encourage you to, to put down your email, and then once the book comes out, um, you can find a way to pre-order it, um, as well as would love if, if w what is the name of your art project? Um, the Future We Create. The Future We Create. Um, if you're interested in learning about go and going to that uh, presentation and the, the gallery presentation of the different um, things, as well as I strongly encourage you to support um, Sunrise and the uh, Marin, uh, Bay Area Youth Climate Summit that UNA works with, as well as if you're in Corte Madera, get involved and learn about the Climate Action Plan. So thank you all so much for part of this, part of this multi-generational relay race to heal the planet. And um, it's, it's amazing to be here and to be part of that. So thank you all. Thank you so much. So as you take your seats, um,
I'm, I was so knocked out by that last session and so really grateful um, just to them. They're brilliant, they're wonderful, they're inspiring. And I hope some of you maybe made a climate pledge during the break and visited some of the organization's tables. Definitely you did that, that's wonderful. Um, and did you, did, were people over at the county's um, Electrify Marin table? Did you uh, get some visitors? Good, and, and uh, ride and drive clean, yes? Okay, wonderful. Um, one big question today is what, is the most, what are the most important actions we can take right now and how will our choices affect our children, their future? We heard from really inspiring students about what they're doing. I know that you know, they kind of knocked a lot of us over um, and I, I was really appreciative of their passion, how articulate they were, how engaged they were and how honest they were. So I'm wearing this hat. One question we hear a lot is how do we pay for all the things we have to do? This says, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it says, make banks green again. <laughs> Another important question to ask is where or what our money is doing when it's parked in our checking account or an investment portfolio. To speak to that, I've invited Ben Stewart, who's the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Bank of the West, He's an avid outdoorsman. Ben has seen glaciers melt and disappear, ocean reefs bleach out and die, and he says he's sick of watching the planet get trashed for profit. He says he's a fast skier. I've seen pictures, but I haven't actually seen him ski. A slow runner, which might be true. Um, a crash-prone cyclist, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, and he confesses to being a pathetic surfer. He's also an advocate for creative courage, with something, that's a phrase that, that, that struck me, and I, I, I like that, creative courage. I think we can all take that one today. He's been asking businesses and consumers, what on earth is your bank financing? That following his presentation, and I'll hand you the mic in a second, um, we'll see a short film from the um, 2014 UN Climate Summit with the voice of God, Morgan Freeman, narrating. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so the, we, I do have a couple of these limited edition hats up here, and so we're going to keep it a little interactive. But first, I'm going to take a quick poll. How many people in this room have a bank account at Chase, Wells, B of A, or Citi? Raise, raise your hands. OK, anyone want to take a guess what four banks are the largest financers of fossil fuels on the planet? All four of them. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to talk about my bank. Uh, I'm going to talk about what your money does uh, when it goes in, uh, when it's in a bank. So if you go to the next slide, uh, it, it doesn't just sit in a bank. Uh, it goes out and finances things. Uh, to the tune of 90 cents of every dollar that you deposit goes back out in the community and finances things. Some of that stuff is great. Some of it's bakeries, some of it's schools, uh, some of it's businesses we love, some of it's not. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit just for a couple minutes uh, about some of those things that you want to be very tuned into. Uh, if you go to the next page, um, tobacco, right? You think, oh, asthma, lung cancer. How about 4.5 trillion microplastic cigarette butts produced every single year? It is the number one most littered item on the planet, more than plastic bottles. Um, all right, so we're going to go to the quiz. What percent of dead seabirds have a cigarette butt in their stomach? Boom, 70. Every single seabird that dies has 70% of them. Who got it? There we go, there you go. Um, that's an incredible number. 50% of dead sea turtles have a cigarette butt uh, in their stomach. Um, they're accountable for ocean acidification, ocean warming, bleach. If your bank is financing big tobacco, so are you. Um, 90 cents of every dollar goes out in the community. Uh, fracking, 
something near and dear to America's heart. 50% of America's oil comes from fracking. How many Olympic-sized swimming pools to the nearest 10,000 <laughs> are created with heavy, toxic water waste that goes into our ground? Oh, there's a winner. 310,000 Olympic swimming pools every year of toxic water. Um, this one, you've got to have a geography. I don't know if we have any skiers, but uh, how many times is the population of Aspen killed every single year as a result of coal? With 13,000 people. Twice. Twice? Twice. Boom, three. Um, uh, so, uh, and this, these are just some of the industries. Uh, there's obviously Arctic drilling. Um, uh, there's tons of else. So my, my, Im, my request of everyone is to pay attention to what your money's doing. Um, if you look at bank deposits around the world right now, anybody want to guess how much is, are in banks around the world? Hundred trillion dollars. Assume 5% of that goes to finance energy. 5% of $100 trillion is a lot of money. Uh, and I would also ask you in my final words, uh, how many people have a retirement account, 401k? Any of those folks have an index fund in there? You own Chevron. Uh, you own Schlumberger, maybe a company you've never heard of, but they're the world's largest mining company. Uh, and so, my request is to ask yourselves, uh, what on earth is your bank financing? Pay attention. Everyone talks about legislation is what moves markets. We see that every day. But the other thing that moves markets, people, consumers. And collectively, $300 trillion we have in our control to move a market. So please, what on earth is your bank financing? That's it. Um, we have a short film, and then the session, the second session, will pop up on the stage. And thank you all. One day, we will wake up to find that the energy that powers the alarm clock came from the breeze through the trees the night before. And we will go to work that morning riding the rays of the sun. It will light our cities and power our businesses. It will warm our homes and cool our workplaces. It will reduce sources of conflict and fuel our economies. It will connect us all. It won't scar the land or poison the seas. The food we eat will be good for our bodies and good for the planet. And the weather that day won't make us worry for tomorrow. There will be more jobs and less disease. The sea level will stop rising. and species will stop dying. The question is, how do we get to that day from where we are today? All 7.3 billion of us. We start by deciding that beyond our doubts and differences, such a day truly exists. And that is something each of us can do today. We can make today the day we stop thinking that the changes required to get there are impossible and beyond us, and start realizing that they are not only possible, but what the future requires of us. We must stop turning from the warnings of science and fear and denial and instead turn toward the solutions and partnerships we need. 
we can make today the day we stop pointing at each other in blame and instead chart a new course together. We have never faced a crisis this big, but we have never had a better opportunity to solve it. We have everything we need to wake up to a different kind of world. We need our leaders to be brave and their choices to be bold. They will either remember us as the generation that destroyed its home or the one that finally came to respect it. We have every reason in the world to act. We can't wait until tomorrow. This is our only home. You can choose today to make a world of difference. Um, wow, so what's possible? It, it seems like I'm going to drop all my cards. That's what's possible. Um, <laughs> a lot's possible. Um, and the four of you, three of you now, thank you so much. Um, uh, just again, everyone, yeah, yeah. I want you to know uh, that, that you had high compliments from, from uh, Riasa. Um, she was knocked out by you, as everyone in the room was, so thank you again. And I hope, we talked about this briefly, but I hope that you will give some closing comments as individuals or as a group, um, however you want to do that. But uh, yeah, send all of, all, all of us adults out into the world with some, some power. So uh, I'm going to introduce this fine panel. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce these people to you and let them share, let them share some of the things that motivated persistent, passionate, stubborn people can accomplish. <laughs> to my left is it, Dr. Itaco Garcia. He's in his third year as superintendent of the Sausalito Marin City School District. He's also the co-executive director of Hip Hop Scholastics. I kind of want to know about that. Dr. Garcia, can I call you Dr. Garcia? You, you okay. can call me what you like. <laughs> Dr. Garcia has been a transform, transformative professional educator for 22 years in some of the most challenged schools in the Bay Area and has dedicated his life and his career to achieving educational equity for all students traditionally failed by our public school system. He's focused on the development of systems and structures to support school transformation and developing equity mindsets and heart sets amongst school and district administrators. He's a member of numerous organizations that serve children and communities, including the National Turnaround Arts Equity Committee, the Principal Leadership Institute Equity Advisory Committee, and the Alameda County Arts Integrated Principal Leadership Network, Cal State Teach Advisory Board, and the Marin County Children and Families Commission. He's a graduate of Marin County Public Schools and received his BA and his doctorate in education from UC Berkeley. And he was recently honored by the California legislature for his work on school desegregation. To his left is Leanne Hoadley. She's the manager of customer and community engagement at MCE Clean Energy and oversees the MCE team that supports key customer and strategic partners community engagement, and inclusion. 
One of her passions is working as an advocate for diversity and inclusion with a focus on individuals with diverse abilities. Leanne has over 20 years of experience managing account services teams and working on large scale energy efficiency projects. Before joining MCE, she was with PG&E. And I want, to, I want you to know that when she sent me her bio, what was that? Because that was me? No. Um, when she sent me her bio, she didn't name PG&E. She said California's largest investor-owned utility. <laughs> and I knew the answer to the question. So anyway, she worked for PG&E, but that's OK. Um, she's, 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 she's home now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, I'm sorry. Um, she, and among other things, was part of an emergency response team. She's held energy related roles at the local nonprofit, state, and federal levels. She received her BA in international politics and honors degrees in humanities from the University of San Francisco. To her left, Carleen Cullen is the founder and executive director of Cool the Earth and Drive Clean Bay Area, and is focused on developing and scaling behavior change, which we all need to pay attention to, um, behavior change programs to mitigate carbon emissions. In 2000, 2007, Carleen founded the Cool the Earth Schools program, which has reached over 500,000 people and motivated 300,000 personal energy-saving actions. The program was adapted during the pandemic as a video engagement series. In 2019, Carlene founded Drive Clean Bay Area, which was recently renamed Ride and Drive Clean. And your table is right over there. It's a collaborative campaign to rapidly accelerate the switch to zero emission vehicles. She is honored to have served as policy advisor for clean transportation to then Governor-elect Gavin Newsom. And prior to her climate work, she helped launch and grow an information technology startup and helped take the company public. Carlene is the recipient of the prestigious Jefferson Award for Public Service, a frequent public speaker, a graduate of climate reality, and has a certificate in community-based social marketing. She holds a BA from Loyola Marymount. And last but not least, David Mahler is a professional engineer with more than four decades of experience in the renewable electric power sector. He has an extensive background in regulatory and policy work at the local, state, and federal levels, and is skilled at strategy, project development, multi-party collaboration, and complex transactions. Long a community activist here in Marin, David is president of the King Mountain Open Space Association, and actually like created the, not only secured that land, but, but created the hiking trails. So real, real, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's it's important. He is also a climate reality uh, Bay Area leader for two very active squads, the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad and the Marin Sonoma Electric Vehicle Squad. And if that's not enough, he organized the Larkspur Climate Group, a citizen group which advocates for policies at the local level to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So. I just introduced all of you, so everyone here knows a little tiny bit about you, but Trevor asked a question of the audience, and I want to ask it of you guys. I know I'm kind of throwing you a curve here. What I'd love to hear from all of you is if you had a climate aha moment, probably not in high school, but that's okay, <laughs> um, but a moment that really shook you up and focused your attention on climate action. And what was that moment like? And I can call on you or you can volunteer. Go, Carlene. I can volunteer. Uh, so very early on when I started Cool the Earth, um, it's a K through five program, and I just started at my kids' school at Basic Elementary, and we weren't even a nonprofit. Um, I had just seen An Inconvenient Truth. And mm -hmm. uh, that really touched me because, um, you know, Al Gore, it's always emotional for you, Al Gore in his film uh, shared how he had nearly lost his son um, and he was in an accident and uh, he described that he took, it took his whole, the earth and shook it upside down and everything dropped off of it as they, as they looked at what was happening in the world and especially through the lens of almost losing their child. Uh, and we also, my husband and I had also um, almost lost our son when he was three and it was a uh, you know terrible experience and so when we uh he's okay now he's in college um and when we saw an inconvenient truth 
you know, I sat and sobbed when uh, Gore talked about almost losing his kid. And, and really, for me, that was, uh, that was why I started Cool the Earth, because I know what it's like to have everything you ever cared about almost, almost leave. And so I was very passionate about protecting our kids and how we can really uh, make this world a, a place that they can enjoy and thrive in and, you know, like these high school students, uh, really feel empowered um, and taking, uh, you know, making this a better place. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go. Uh, so mine actually, uh, you know, the, the, the question or the comments about going back to high school actually struck a chord for me. Uh, so when I was uh, a student at UC Berkeley, Cal grad also, in engineering school, uh, was in the uh, early 70s. And um, that was when all the big, uh, the first big climate legislation was passed. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the Environmental Protection Act, and, and all, all those, those big bills. And I was really struck at how uh, the engineering community there, the faculty, was just total pushback on all that. They thought, <laughs> burdens, obstacles, no, we don't need this stuff. And uh, I had a, an opportunity uh, to be the class valedictorian at my graduation, and I went up there. <laughs> this is going to be hard for me, too. <laughs> and I said, no, these are not burdens and obstacles. These are the way we need to be headed. We need to have this uh, environmental perspective. We need to have social consciousness. We, we, this is where we need to be headed. And that was really sort of the start of my activism, and then seeing uh, inconvenient truth uh, really shifted into high gear specifically around climate, so. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think for me it came in bits and pieces. Um, and it started probably uh, awakening a little bit more in me um, in my 20s when I started to um, run for exercise and I was w ran with a group of people and we did a lot of long distance running around San Francisco um, and we loved running in the Presidio because then you wouldn't have to deal with so many cars and street lights and I just loved the Presidio San Francisco and loving something you, you start to learn more about it and what I learned was that there was flora and fauna in the Presidio that was now extinct everywhere else in San Francisco, but because it had been an army base and protected for so long, the flora and fauna had been able to survive in this small, you know, I think it's, you know, very, uh, 1,700 acres or maybe it's around that, maybe it's smaller than that area. And I thought, well, gosh, if, if it's extinct in just this small area, what does that mean for development all over the place? And um, at the time, I was a food broker. And that means the middleman between manufacturer and distributor. And this isn't nice little farming manufacturing. This is big factory manufacturing. And, um, and so this was another one of those wake-up calls. I went to visit where eggs came from. Mm -hmm. And it was the most just jaw-dropping experiences, I think, that I can ever remember. And you walk into this, you know, huge factory-like building with no windows, and the door opens, and you're just hit by this smell that you cannot believe. And you see what they talk about on TV, these poor chickens that are kept in these little cages that their wings get stuck up here, and they can't pull them back down because they're all in these cages that are actually at a slant. So when they lay the egg, the egg just nicely rolls into the conveyor belt, so they don't ever even get to rest. And of course, I instantly became a vegetarian, um, like a really strict vegetarian. <laughs> and I thought, I'm at a crossroads. This is not what I can do with my, what I feel like I can do with my life, sorry. Um, and so those two things combined, realizing the, how quickly we made flora fauna extinct and what we were doing from um, an animal meat production perspective. Um, don't even get into what happens with the cows, but um, that's where I made a transition into an environmental um, work life. Now mine did start, it didn't actually start at PG&E, it started um, running a small nonprofit in the Presidio of San Francisco, but here we are today. So that's, 
My aha moments were small, but consistent. Powerful. No, no, that's not small. <laughs> Those are powerful. These are all powerful. Yeah, I'd, I'd give a similar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd give a similar response as, as Leanne. Um, I, I grew up in Southern Marin. I was born in San Francisco. We moved back to Marin in about 1981. And you know, for those of you that are longtime Marin residents, you'll 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 remember when it used to really rain here. Yeah. Um, you know, 1981 was a particularly heavy rain year. We had a, a biblical 40 days and 40 nights of rain. You could canoe from downtown Mill Valley to Sausalito. <laughs> Um, for a couple weeks, actually, it was it was uh, pretty prodigious, and um, you know, I I, I want to name some privilege, and 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 I think um, having this awareness is a little bit of a privilege in some ways because mm. when we're just struggling to meet our housing needs or our food needs, or you know, um, sometimes it's it's hard to look up and look around and realize um, maybe what's happening in the larger world around us, and. I was very privileged to grow up in a house that my grandfather purchased in 1965. And that house is um, about a mile past Four Corners on Panoramic Highway. And so the Golden Gate National Recreation Area and um, Muir Woods was sort of my backyard. And, and so I grew up you know, loving the Marin County open space that many, many of us enjoy in this county. And just looking at the progression of climate change just from, you know, I was, I was aware of climate change in high school. I don't think I was doing anything remotely about it the way that you all are, <laughs> so thank you. But, it, but it, I, I, I did genuinely raise my hand. It was in my consciousness. And, you know, again, it's a miracle we haven't had a large wildfire in Marin. You know, I spent, you know, days and weeks in my community helping neighbors, helping my Helping, you know, helping my mom just make fire breaks. And mm -hmm. uh, my godfather used to be, at, uh, used to be on firewatch mm -hmm. at the fire tower on the, on the top of Mount Tam. And so I've had the opportunity to go up there and, and do a few shifts up there. And, um, you know, I think I got really galvanized in college. I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate. And um, I had a, um, a um, it was either a, uh, a geology or a geography course, some, somewhere there in the environmental sciences. I was, I was a liberal arts major, but you, know, you, you got to take a bunch of things at UC Berkeley that were interesting and met your graduation requirements. And we had this professor who was an absolute climate change denier. <laughs> um, he was convinced that it was hooey, that you know the planet just changes on its own, doesn't matter what human beings do, and I was in that class with a lot of actually environmental science majors. And I was absolutely shocked, not only by his stance at, at a flagship UC, mm -hmm. but by the conversations that I was hearing from people about going into environmental science. And many of them were looking at going into things like forestry. And we had a few outdoor, um, learning experiences in that class. And a lot of the conversation I heard from the, my generation of people that were going into environmental science was still about, oh, look, imagine how we could clear cut this mm -hmm. forest so that you know, we could create more, more, you know, uh, you know, more building materials. And I thought, that seems <laughs> like the wrong stance. I don't, I'm not sure what, I, what I'm going to do about it yet, but that, that's where I think I'm... That's not I'm, it, yeah. I, yeah, I, it's the opposite of that, right? Whatever, whatever that means. Um, and so that's, that's when I kind of became aware. Um, it wasn't until really that I began um, teaching in my mid-20s that I really felt like I had any sort of a role as as having an impact or, 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 or being an activist. And I, and I um, began, uh, I taught kindergarten for many years, and I realized that if mm. we can um, raise our consciousness from the very beginning of our journey as human beings um, and, um, and the very beginning of our education, mm -hmm. then we, we may actually, over a generation or two, have a chance to really make a systemic change uh, in what's happening in our, 
in our planet. And um, we, we, we had a pledge to the earth mm -hmm. that we said every morning in my kindergarten classes, funny it is emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, those were good times, right? <laughs> but that's, that was my first small effort mm -hmm. to try just from the very beginning of education to have children grounded in indigenous wisdom, to have them understand that we only have one planet and, uh, and we're the keepers of it. Yeah. We need Kleenexes up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a moment to breathe too. Thanks. We'll all do that. Yeah. I, obviously, you have a group of panelists that care about this. Subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no dearth of emotion here, and 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 passion and compassion. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Leanne and just ask you a question. You and I, um, I think you told me the other day that MCE has developed a school toolkit. Yeah, and. You've, I know you've worked on that, and you, so Cool the Earth has, is working on things, and, and MCEL, and MCOE, and, and I mean, there are all of these programs. Talk to us about how MCE is bringing this to our schools and our communities, and, and how, can, how can this room support that? Well, it, it really came <clears throat> from the schools. So we would get phone calls from either teachers or parents or maybe even students saying, we've got a green team. Um, do you have some materials that we can use to help us guide our conversation around the environment and, um, and climate change? And we, we didn't have those. We didn't have anything. Um, and so um, myself, somebody on my team, Sebastian is here, um, and some interns got together. And we thought, well, we need to put together uh, a toolkit that we can have as a resource to schools when they call and they ask, how do we have a conversation around, around climate change and energy? Um, and so last year we worked on it with, with interns and some internal folks, and I have to say um, also with the School of Environmental Leadership in Marin, so thank you. You've, um, the students there put a lot of work into it as well. And now we have this toolkit that not only talks about <coughs> the different elements of climate change, from transportation to energy to uh, food and all of the, the, the entire chain, but also different actions that they can take from small to, to large, um, and then resources. We also feature some of the work that our, our local students around the Bay Area are doing because that's going to make all the difference. So we started not with anything this time last year, and now we actually have a really, what I think is a really pretty toolkit. Um, we're calling it a youth uh, energy toolkit, but it really would apply to all of us. There isn't a single action in there that is um, only focused towards youth. It is really for all of us. So if any of you have an environment where you're looking for things, um, ways to spark the conversation and have actionable ideas, take, uh, give us a call and we'll, um, we, you, can, you can access it on our website and download it. We haven't printed it out so much yet. I think we're going to soon, but we're trying to reduce paper. So it's downloadable, free to everybody. So thank you students for really helping create um, you know, the need and asking us for it. It's a question for you. MCE started here in Marin. It's now in Marin, Contra Costa, Napa, and Solano. Mm -hmm. So it grown exponentially, which is amazing. There are 19 school districts in Marin County. 19. Why? <laughs> um, how, how can this room access it and, and spread the word and get it into classrooms, into courses, um, into families, you know, into the backpack on Friday um, to, to go home? What is, is there, and I'm, I'm kind of asking everybody that question. Um, this is the sort of thing that um, I think part of the reason I started Drawdown Bay Area is because things get so siloed and we need to be sharing, Cool the Earth has done some amazing work and uh, some amazing work here and some amazing work there and it's like, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could take all of that and put it together and share it as quickly as possible. So I, I'm offering that you know, idea for all of you to think about what is it that you can do. Can, I think you, you and I were talking last week or we were talking last week um, about going to school board meetings 
and, and, and PTA meetings and, and bringing these things up and, and your child's teacher, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of things that, you know, we, we can do and, you know, green, green is the theme today, right? And so, um, ironically, the day after St. Patrick's Day. Um, and and I, I want to, you know, um, inc encourage us actually to really work together mm -hmm. on these kinds of initiatives. Mm -hmm. Um, my board president, Ida Green, uh, who unfortunately just stepped out of the room, hopefully she'll be back, but, um, and, and our school district, um, along with a lot of community leaders, Ms. Terry Green, who was here earlier today, Ms. June Farmer, um, representing Shore Up Marin City, there's a, a Sausalito Climate Justice Commission. One of the biggest things that I see that is a challenge for us in this space is we're really all working in silos, even though we're all working towards the same thing. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we need to break down. We, we have to work together. This, this, this is the wealthiest, second wealthiest county in the country. We have some of the most open uh, percentage of green space in the country. We have some of the lowest population. If we can't get it done here, then where, right? So we, 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 we have to really work together and we have to make some commitments that are uh, inter interagency or intergovernmental, right? I have greatly appreciated all of the focus on what we can do as individuals. And our youth here kind of entered, entered the idea that, hey, maybe, and our, 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 our gentleman that was representing the banking industry, hey, maybe there's, there's, there's a larger systems pressure that needs to mm -hmm. be put into place here. And I want to really encourage us to do just that. Because at this point, while all of us need to make individual commitments, it's not enough. We need a systems change. And that really comes from cities and counties and school districts all really working together. So we unified our community mm -hmm. um, this past year. We got the first desegregation order in the state of California in the past 50 years. We brought Sausalito Marin City back together for the first time in a long time. It's that kind of a unification <clears throat> of communities that we have to have across this county. And in that process, we worked with our staff and our parents and our students around what kind of curriculum they wanted to see at our school. Mm -hmm. And a focus on social justice and climate justice is, is our two pillars of our curriculum of our unified school. Mm -hmm. And so these are the kinds of commitments that we need to make. We need to make commitments of resource and time so that teachers can use the curriculums that have been developed, develop their own curriculum. And, um, and so that there's partnerships between the GGNRA and uh, you know, Marin County Parks and different city parks and rec departments. There's, there's a ton of things we can do. And yes, at, talk to your teachers, talk to your principals, come to your school board meetings in a loving and gentle way. I'm not just saying that selfishly. No. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, educators in many senses have borne the, the brunt of the trauma of this pandemic, yeah. educa mm -hmm. educators and children. And as we come out, and things aren't perfect, and things aren't the way everybody wants them exactly to be, I want to invite everybody to remember that. Um, because many people have pushed through things that other folks haven't. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's delicate, and we need to be gentle and human with each other. Um, the last thing I'll say, I think, too, is you know we, we are doing some things in our district. We um, have the only uh, farm-to-fork uh, organic school lunch program in the county. It's expensive, I'm not gonna lie, but those are things that you could advocate for in your communities. I mentioned we have this, this and, I, and I, I, I wanna also de-silo the idea that climate justice and social justice is two different things. <laughs> it's not, it's the same conversation, it's the same thing. Um, so curriculum development, curriculum implementation, uh, we passed a school bond in 2020 together. We're the only school district to pass it a GO school bond in 2020, and we're committed to um, green design, daylighting the creek on our Sausalito campus, making a, a, an all-electric, energy-sufficient, resilient building with solar, with, with backup power generation, right, <laughs> with a microgrid. Uh, we're, we're working um, currently, right now, actually, our very first pro uh, capital uh, improvement project that we're going to be able to manifest um, comes from from MCE and MBL is the installation of a solar array and a backup battery at our Marin City campus. Um, 
We know that public safety power shutoffs until we all pressure PG&E to underground their power lines like they all are on the East Coast, because guess what? They have worse storms than us and they never lose power. Um, it's gonna keep happening. So schools are gonna have to operate without power. And that means we need green microgrid school buildings so that when PG&E shuts off the power, all of your kids still have somewhere to go. They still can get a meal. They still can get a bathroom. They still can get a safe space. And I think we all saw from the pandemic what happens when schools are closed mm -hmm. to kids' physical and mental health and well-being. Yeah. And so we should be the community. We should be the county that in every school, public or private, has a climate, social justice, education curriculum. And the only thing stopping us is unifying together as a community and will. And so that's what I would ask all of you to do is just help push that will and that unification in our community because we can, we have the solutions. We just need to teach them to our children and empower them to be leaders. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I, I was leaning in not to interrupt you, but to say the, the, the project that you just talked about, the Canopy Solar, and EV charging and a battery storage at the Marin City um, Martin Luther King School is a partnership with MCE, with um, the Marin Community Foundation, with the school district. It's, it was a, it's an amazing, that is collaboration to get something done that's really important and makes a huge difference in the community. So that's an example of the collaboration that I think we were trying to promote, right? Uh, it's, it's amazing stories. I didn't, I not only do not have my glasses with me, um, it's okay. No, I'm, um, but I also don't have my phone, so I need a time check. <laughs> it's 11 at 5. Okay, when are we supposed to wrap up? 11.30. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> it's been one of those days. It's a full moon. It's a full moon, folks. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask David, because we're, we're talking about teaching and, and being curious and learning. Uh, I learn a lot from this guy. Um, he, he, he does a lot of stuff and he does it really well. Uh, and you mentioned that you were teaching, uh, not a class exactly, but you were doing a demonstration on heat pumps right. last night, mm -hmm. which cool. I missed, because I was working on PowerPoint presentations and things like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's, I mean, so you're out in the community as an individual and you're doing that sort of thing to a small group of people. I would love to know more about that, but I also would love to know how we can do it bigger. How, we, how do we scale that? This, the one-offs are great, they're important, but we need to be scaling this stuff much more quickly. Any thoughts about that? So, uh, just for clarity, are you talking about scaling uh, the, the uh, action? Uh, where, uh, the adoption of the, yeah. the, okay. the, the implementation, the, the, tr the transition from gas and fossil fuels to an electrification of buildings in this case. Yeah. Well, as, as a foundation for that, I, I have to say, I am a strong advocate of electrifying everything. And uh, if you haven't read uh, Saul Griffith's book called Electrify, you should get that book and read it. Uh, it, it makes the case that it's stunning, quite frankly. Yes. Uh, if we were to electrify everything, just, just at the starting point, if we were to electrify everything, Electricity is so much more efficient, and this would be renewably generated electricity, is so much more efficient as a source of energy. Right there, it would reduce our overall global energy use by 25% just by electrifying. I mean, think about it, 25% just by electrifying. And of course, what would come along with that is millions of jobs, cleaner air, a radical reduction in the climate impacts. I mean, it's, it's like a stunning thing. So most of my work around this area is focused on how do we electrify everything? How do we bring it to scale? How do we do it quickly? That's why I asked and, you. And I think, <laughs> in truth, in truth, we need to do everything. You know, we need to be working at the policy level. Uh, we need to be look at working at the community level. We need to be looking at what we do individually in our own individual decisions. We need to be aggregating people together, learning. And at every place where we can make a change, we should be making a change. It's, it's not like they're going to do it. It's like we have to do it. And anyone in this room that thinks, oh, you know, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I, I'm just one person. I don't have much power in this. You know, there's all these. You have a lot of power. And I, I'm just going to talk not only about what you do in your own life, but you can influence your local governments. 
uh, the, the couple of teams that I'm involved in here, we've had some really significant impact on local policy here in Marin County and Sonoma County. Uh, and as the communities start taking action, it starts influencing what happens at the state. And as the state takes action, it starts influencing federal. So, you know, come in from all angles, large, small, you know, grouped individually. Uh, and I want to talk uh, about uh, an effort right here in Marin County that you can all be involved in. And that is uh, the County of Marin is leading an effort to adopt for Marin County uh, a uh, all electric ordinance for new construction. So you're mentioning about the heat pumps. Turns out uh, the use of natural gas, which is methane gas, very cleverly called natural gas, uh, <laughs> fossil gas, methane gas, uh, in our buildings, primarily for space and water heating, creates about 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And the actual number may be much greater than that because methane itself, that 25% that is from burning it, changing it mostly into CO2 and the CO2 going into the atmosphere. But methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, uh, dozens of times more potent than uh, CO2. And there's a lot of leakage involved in the extraction, transportation, the use of methane. All that methane's going into the atmosphere. So if we can ramp down our use of methane uh, for uh, heating water and heating space in all our buildings, it can work its way back up the supply chain and have a big impact. So we're in county, and Brian Rays is, is the, <laughs> the lead guy for this for the county, uh, is leading an effort to adopt a, a county level ordinance that would be uh, all electric for new buildings, for major remodels, uh, it would have a point system that would lead pretty much to all electric. And they're really emphasizing that each of us individually, when our gas water heaters and furnaces uh, go out to replace them with all electric heat pump models. And so, again, it's one of these things where we're sort of coming in from all sides. And where you come into this, that's just Marin County, the unincorporated area. What we're trying to do is to bring all 11 Marin jurisdictions, in, uh, other than the county, into that effort and have all 12 Marin jurisdictions adopt an all electric ordinance for new buildings, major remodels, and with a strong emphasis on encouraging people and incenting people to replace upon burnout uh, their own appliances with this. If we can get the whole county to adopt this, a uniform ordinance at the same time, effective January 1st, 23, January 1st, next year, it can have a major impact on this county and can sort of set a model for <coughs> other counties to do this on a countywide basis. And it's going to take all of you going to your uh, uh, town or city councils and saying, I am concerned about natural gas use in buildings in Marin County. I want you to direct your staff to participate in this effort that the county is leading. Uh, and when that ordinance comes forward, I want you to adopt that to be uh, applicable in our, our city or town. And it's a perfect example of how everyone in this room can just go to the public comment period at your council meeting and just say that. You could do it now. Mm -hmm. And if you we need talking points, I've got them. I'll get them to you. <laughs> Talk to Brian, and uh, we'll, we'll get you talking points. There's some literature about this over there on the Electrify Marin table. But uh, what I was doing was just, last night was another angle. A group reached mm -hmm. out to me and said, eh, what's all this stuff about heat pumps? I want to understand this. Can you help us? So I took them from that first inkling of, maybe I'm interested in a heat pump, to the point where you would get a contractor, because that's a gap right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think you know, there's no silver bullet in any of this stuff. There it's is, all it's silver buckshot. Exactly. We need, to, we need exactly. everybody involved at high levels, low levels, personal levels. Uh, at every possible way you can you work. But do get that book. That's, that's uh, a really enlightening book. I'm so speaking of getting... I'm about to make that change myself. Oh, sorry. I'm about to make the change yeah, myself go. in my and, house. And it's hard. That, that first step is hard. I'm having to upgrade my panel, but I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. We were going to do an induction, cooking demo induction stove cooking demonstration, and getting all of that set up was a nightmare, so we didn't do that. Um, we were going to also try and get a video of it, and that's not nearly as much fun. But let me tell you, <laughs> I saw a demonstration where the, uh, the chef put a terry cloth towel over the top of the stove, then put the pot on top of the terry cloth towel, and then started stir frying. The towel was fine. <laughs> the towel did not burn. And he said, oh, no, I always do this, because it makes cleaning up so much easier. It's like, OK. 
But speaking of getting off of fossil fuels, um, you, my friend, are deeply engaged in the transportation world. And talk a little bit about starting Drive Clean Marin that then became Drive Clean Bay Area that is now Ride and Drive Clean. And, and your focus on, I mean, it's obviously zero emission transportation does not mean go buy an EV necessarily. If you can do that, great. But, um, but th there's much more to it. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Sure. Uh, so in our work, we really are focused on tangible outcomes. And uh, so we kind of work at two different levels. And one is um, advocating for acceleration of EV adoption uh, individually, as well as other e-mobility or kind of the traditional walk and bike and public transportation. So really looking at, uh, as David said, how we electrify uh, our transportation. Um, so that's kind of at the Marin County level and the Bay Area level and now at a national level with the U.S. League of Women Voters and with International Rotary. So we're both very focused on how do we get individuals to you know, avoid making another uh, gas car on the road. Um, as well as uh, I worked for the governor for a year and a half as his policy advisor when he was running for, uh, for governor. And so my main policy advice was you know, how do we stop, how do, how do we start at the very top and uh, my main policy advice was to ban the internal combustion engine vehicle, new sales of it by 2030. Uh, I was extremely pleased uh, when he passed that in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> that sort of policy, very tangible, setting the path for, uh, you know, for the state and really for the country is, is just essential. Um, one of the things we're working on now um, is in how do we also make sure we include our equity communities and people in multifamily, which also has a, you know, significant overlap. Because right now, anybody who lives in a multifamily property, if they want to drive electric, they're going to pay about 400 to 500% more than anybody that can plug in at home. Uh, and so this transition is happening. And there's new technologies. There's some uh, new technologies. One of the startups is uh, principally financed by the two founders of Tesla, that's uh, not Elon Musk, um, These two, the two actual founders. Uh, there's new smart outlook technology where uh, we can actually have people in multifamily be able to plug in if they have a place to park. So uh, really looking at different levels that we can address this from you know, individuals. Um, one of the things we talk about education, so when I started Cool the Earth, we're really working on two different things, you know, the kids and the adults and the policy. Uh, when we started Cool the Earth, it was really about how we educate kids and how we, we have them influence their parents. Because adults are very difficult in terms of getting <laughs> open-minded, change, et cetera. And with kids, um, in integrating the arts in it and having plays and assemblies, they can really uh, influence the families, the parents, and, and ultimately um, you know, our, our, our policies. So. Kudos to you. Can, can I ask you a question about what you Absolutely. just said? Why is it harder for folks that live in multifamily homes to have access to charging in your opinion? So one of the reasons it's difficult for multifamily is that typically uh, there's no, it's, it's kind of a, com a technical thing, but uh, if you do have power outlets in your parking stall, which most people don't right now, so you have to be able to upgrade the panel, be able to draw the electricity to that. And one of the major barriers is property owners don't want people just plugging in their car for free. Um, it becomes this issue, you know, some people do, some people don't. So until recently, without this uh, smart outlet technology, uh, it was really, um, you know, a financial issue for this. So. Um, there's building upgrades that need to happen. There's being able to uh, charge at your individual stall. Um, so we're really looking at there's, there's many different ways to charge a vehicle, um, level one, two, three, different speeds, et cetera. And um, we're looking not only at new building stock and making sure that that becomes 100% that they should have uh, EV charging available, but especially at existing building stock because anybody in these communities is going to be you know suffering from the highest prices externally so really working on that new solution and starting with the governor talking about creating a new rebate program for existing building stock uh, we're looking at some affordable housing here in marin county and trying to do a pilot test to understand what the community actually wants we don't want to assume that they want a certain sort of technology to do a pilot test to understand what works 
uh, starting with our affordable housing here in Marin. And we have a, a partnership with Canal Alliance to start doing some of that testing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Leanne a question. I'm going to start to wrap this up because I think we're, we're hitting time here. But we talked about the roles of, of women in the energy world, and you've seen changes. Um, but I'm curious to, to know what's, what, what, are, what are we on the cusp of? What are you seeing? What's, what's about to shift in terms of how both people in the industry as well as the consumers interact. What are you seeing, because you deal with customers all the time in lots of different communities. I'll start by acknowledging what we've accomplished in the last decade, which I think we have to acknowledge to keep that bit of hope um, that we keep trying to get back to, right? Um, that fear and that hope together. I wish I had this really exciting graph to show you. Um, because <laughs> if you looked at the graph of our energy use in California over the last 10 years, it's, it's like a graph. You know, here you, you, you wake up in the morning and you start using your hair dryer or whatever it might be and you go to work or you stay at home and all your lights go on. So it's this graph that kind of gradually goes up, it's a kind of a large camel hump in the middle of the day. And then typically you go home, but then you turn on AC like in the summertime or whatever you're doing in the house cooking, and you get a little hump in the evening. That's been the traditional energy use in California. What we have seen in the last 10 years, which I think is extraordinary, is that big mountain of energy that we all use all day is now this giant hole because it's being filled with renewable energy, which is extraordinary. <laughs> now, when the sun goes down, <laughs> we still have to ramp up to deal with that, that, that second camel hump at the, at the end of the day. We're all, you know, it's called the peak, and now we've, we're all getting switched to this evening peak, four to nine, reduce your energy. It's because when the sun goes down, we don't want to have all of those fossil fuel plants spinning in reserve to, to, to serve it. And that's why we're now looking at really coupling all of this solar with battery storage, which is what the Bayside yes. MLK School is doing, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> so what I'm seeing now is we have done this in 10 short years. I will give you one more statistic. And 10 short years, so MCE, it's no fluke that MCE started in Marin, right? A grassroots uh, uh, drive because Marin County said, we can get to a higher renewable content in the state of California quicker than the IOUs and the investor-owned utilities are doing it. We know we can do it. And so when the legislation went into effect in 2002 to make it possible for communities to buy energy on their own behalf, which is what MCE does for, for our counties, um, we started buying at a higher renewable content. So MCE is, is the flat rate is about 61% renewable. We have 100% renewable option. I just say that to say that in 10 short years, one, we've moved a mountain of energy into green power. Extraordinary. Um, and what I see is continuing to then deal with that ramp up with renewables, increasing wind, solar, and battery, biomass, which is something the state's now really um, behind with some legislation, and um, small hydro, not, not large hydro, which is not renewable. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited with what we've accomplished, and now with all of this energy towards it, you know, the good kind of the good kind of energy, the kind that we all come with, um, really solving things in California from an energy perspective um, in ways that just was, they were not fathomable just 10 years ago. 
Yeah. And we almost didn't survive 10 years ago. It was actually yeah. 12 years ago, but It was yes. 12, well, right, yeah. well, and I'm but, looking at the load curve. Right. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I see it and I don't see, you know, the challenge of it. I see something extraordinary that we did. Can I make a comment about the, yeah. uh, so, you know, on the battery technology, one thing uh, that we're looking at is school buses. So in Pittsburgh, a low income community on the East Bay, uh, they have their schools powered by electric school buses. It's all integrated. They have like a microgrid. And I know that we spoke about, you know, you all are trying to do that as well. So, uh, you know, electric vehicles also can now uh, act as your power st storage as well, and you can use that. So these batteries in these vehicles have multi-purpose, not just for moving us around, but also for being able to absorb the energy and use it. So I know when there's a power outage, even now, I have my lights on, I have my music on, you know, we, have, we can really live off of the battery from the, the, uh, the vehicle. And so more of that is coming and it's dual purpose. It also reduces the amount of minerals and natural resources if we can have multi-purpose from a single battery. So um, that's really exciting and I'm glad MCE is you know, really involved in making sure that we take advantage of our renewable energy. That's a great example because at Pittsburgh School that was, that, that adapted or adopted the EV buses early, they are now doing solar plus battery on I think 10 of their schools. So they are going to be fully resilient like, like you are. <laughs> Thoughts? What do you want to see in the future? What would you like to see accomplished soon? What well, can we do in the next five years? I'll, I'll double down on what I said earlier, which is I would love to see this county uh, and, and every public school and private and independent school in this county be uh, a leader in this nation on, on really having a fully vertically articulated climate justice curriculum pre-K through 12. One of the things that um, we're doing is... <laughs> Thank you. One of the things we're doing is working with the Presidio Graduate School of Education mm -hmm. with our teachers to develop their own units of study. And it strikes me right now as a big miss that we're not backwards mapping from what SEL is mm. doing at Terra Linda High to scaffold that or your toolkit. Or, and that's what I mean about kind of de-siloing these exactly. efforts. Um, and so I hope everyone that is an educator in the room, I see some friends here, can, can help um, advocate for that. Um, so that's what I'd like to see. That's a good vision. David, how about you? Uh, you know, uh, there, there's, there's two parts of it uh, for me, really. One is uh, I, I think my vision involves a much greater and broader uh, awareness. Uh, I think everybody at this point, uh, pretty much everybody, is, is accepting and aware of climate change, that it's a happening deal. Uh, but I think there's still a huge number of people that just it's way beyond me. Right. Somebody else is going to solve it if it's solvable. It's, it's, uh, there's nothing I can do. And I think that transition to personal responsibility, where we're all engaged in working on the solution and realizing that our actions are part of the solution, uh, that's part of my vision. There's, there's a group I'm sure many of you uh, are aware of it here in Marin County, Resilient Neighborhoods, uh, that helps people uh, understand <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, their personal impacts and broadens their awareness, not on a movie screen like an inconvenient truth, but actually looking at their own lives and their own communities. If you haven't taken uh, that, that uh, training or course, I strongly urge that. Part of my vision is that, and then a, a full-on embrace to electrifying everything. And there's, there's so many things in place now. The technologies are all here. Policies are, are happening, policy action uh, at the community level and at the regional level with the uh, Air Quality Management District. The state will probably be adopting regulations around this. So the push is going to be there. And I think the combination of people understanding their role in this and then the push the, the policy push, and clearly there's gonna be a lot more jobs, <laughs> and there's gonna be a lot more manufacturing going on to push this whole thing forward will be the economics of it. And that's, I, I, I think we can get there, and that's my vision. That so there. are there any electeds left in the room? Excellent, I, yeah, Uncle Bruce, brave man. Um, one of the things that well, in San Jose, the city of San Jose has a really aggressive um, building electrification plan. 
And you're talking about there's a big push. Well, there's also a big push back. And I used to work um, in, in government for an elected. And I can tell you, this isn't true for every elected, but it's really true when there's five of you sitting like this on a dais, and there's a whole lot of angry people who shout down reasonable actions. So I have to say, in, in just in defense of my, my former bosses, that they need cover. They need people to show up and say, yeah, 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 they're making a lot of noise over there, but really what you're trying to do is hard, and it's really good, and we really support you. So don't stop just because they're angry and noisy. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a big deal. And I think that there's a, a disconnect between communication and, and the way government works um, with the community. And one of the things that San Jose is talking about is a full-on campaign to support this effort that, that's going to be in front of their city council, um, I think, in June. So it's, it's that kind of thing. It's like, oh, of course it makes sense. Of course they would vote for that. Of course they would. <gasps> But then the slings and arrows, and they're going to get, you know, they're going to get uh, primaried and all of that. So it's 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 a real deal. We we need to be supporting each other. We need to be supporting smart, good work. I know I'm the moderator. I'm not supposed to be talking, but um. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that you know um, this may seem very crass, but uh, you know at there this are children here. Yeah. Well, <laughs> speaking speaking for them, especially <laughs> their their you know yes the the corporate ESG issues. Um, so, especially at the state and national level, the way our capitalist system works is, you know, consumers spend their money, corporations know what consumers want, corporations influence our state and our national leaders, and that's really, for better or for worse, how the capitalist system in America works. And so we, that means we are the starting point. What we want to consume, where we want to spend our dollars, influences these corporations and where they are headed, and then they take their money. So I always say, you know, when you're buying gasoline, you're not just contributing to climate change, you're also contributing to put money into the pockets of the oil companies who are turning around and lobbying and spend all of their money lobbying to make sure that climate justice and climate policies are completely ameliorated. So it's really important that we understand that we, besides our carbon impact, also have this pocket impact pocket purse influence as well, and that we really need to spend our money in ways that tell corporations what we want and so that they don't turn around and lobby against us, but actually become our allies. That's a great point. That's a great point. It's a great point. Are there, we have a, we have a, a handheld mic up here. Um, are there questions for this group? We've got a pretty amazing group here. I have to jump off of that. Thank you. And there's one over here, too. We'll just hug, hug this mic. We got First, um, thank you so much for all the things that all of you have done. It's great. I'm Jenny Pfeiffer. I'm a trustee, board trustee at Bellina Stinson School District. And um, I have been working now um, in our committee for staff housing and because we know why. And there have been now these mandates where there are um, going to have to be so many houses built here and built there and built there, which on one hand is a good thing. But this is always a question of a good thing also has another side. I heard on the way over here, and this underlines the other areas we're working on, which is diversity, inclusion, sustain, uh, um, uh, in, uh, inclusion and diversity, diversity equity. and, and equity. equity. Thank you. <laughs> I, I know the DEI and I'm trying to think of the words. Anyway, um, we're a district. We have a lot of houses being sold, vast amounts of money. It pushes out our marginal families. They have no place to live there. So we're, our school is getting a lot of tax money. We're getting rich. We're losing students. It's a hard thing. Mm. These mandates, while they're good, reminded me of what I heard on the radio on the way here, talking about redlining. And that used to be a thing where um, particular racial equality uh, areas. And those are the areas with the biggest problems with toxic environment, toxic air. 
we're sort of doing that now. If we don't address these mandates as requiring them to be sustainable housing, then we are putting our marginalized people back into areas where they're not having the benefits that people who can afford what you're saying we should be doing with turning your house electric, all those things. So here's my question. Can we work, say with your district, we're surrounded by Starroot Farms, which is uh, the grandfather of organic farms, pretty much, in our area. And we could work with the university, uh, USF, which now owns that, mm -hmm. and we could show your students how that happens, and you could show our students how what goes on after that, what's going on there. We can work together in those ways. Can we set up those <laughs> things where we can work on how we live, how you live? We have a very white district. Our two people of color in our school district could stand to have some people come over from Marin City. Anyway, we need to work on those things. How, all of you, I'd like some feedback. How can we make these mandates be sustainable construction? There's nothing being said about that. Yeah, thank, thanks for that offer. And certainly, uh, President Green and I, I'm sure, would be happy to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, about um, some some further ways that we can we can partner, um, and and I, I'm going to use the word partner very strategically in, in opposed to collaboration. Um, collaborations often end when both sides get what they need. Partnerships are sustainable agreements and bonds between interdisciplinary uh, organizations, and so. Um, I think the, the quick and dirty answer is yes, absolutely. I do think we get some of our produce from Starwood Farms already. We have a partnership in place with USF for our Teacher of Color Pipeline credentialing program. And so um, I, I think there's probably some very natural opportunities. One other thing I'll say in response to um, what you brought up is um, part of uh, what we are um, currently looking at um, with our uh, facilities development program is workforce housing. Um, in Sausalito, and um, there's there's a very uh, particular reason we're looking at workforce housing in Sausalito, and it's because the majority of low-income, high-density housing in our county already exists in Marin City, right? And so, how 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 long are we going to focus the high-density, low-income housing developments in our county in one historically black community? Right? And so that's why we're actually looking at our Sausalito campus for a workforce housing development. And I know, because I grew up on the mountain, um, it, it is a little, of a, a little bit of a, of a far haul from Sausalito to, to Stinson and Bolinas in, in, in the morning. But one of the things that we may be able to also partner on is I'm sure you have educators just like we do that are driving from over an hour away outside of this county. People come from way off in Sonoma. People come from way out in the East Bay. I've got people commuting to our school every day from as far as Tracy, California. And it's because of two things. Although I think we pay pretty good salaries at our school district, it's not enough to even rent a place in Marin. I, you know, People sometimes look at my salary and say, well, that guy makes a lot of money. Guess what? Even at my superintendent salary right now, I cannot afford to buy a home in Marin County. Now, I'm blessed. I'm a homeowner in the East Bay. My mother's still in the house that I grew up in. But for many of us that are here to educate your children, living in Marin simply isn't a reality. Unless you already own a home here or your parents or your grandparents own a home here, there's almost no way to get into this real estate market at an educator's salary. And so if you want sustainable education, you want folks that are great teachers, teachers of color, teachers of diverse ability, I love that word, thank you, I'm gonna just liberally borrow it, um, then we have to do something in this area. And there is a, there is a, an educator workforce housing project being looked at in the development in San Quentin. Um, there, there's our educator uh, workforce housing initiative that we're, we're hoping to partner with the city of Sausalito on. 
because as you mentioned, every municipality has these arena numbers. And guess what? Much like some of the other things that we've talked about in, in, in Marin that aren't quite so popular, that's something that most Marin residents are happy to support over there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we, we have to transform our own belief, our own heart set and mindset in this regard and say, we, we, we don't just, we're not just politically liberal. We don't just walk this talk, we, but, but we don't just talk this talk, but we walk this talk. And that means that we need to welcome low income workforce housing development in every single community in this county. Yeah. So but I, we, I, we do need to kind of start okay. to wrap up here. I'll make this, this quick, though. Uh, you, you also talked about the mandates, and I, I want to make sure everyone understands this. So when we're talking about building electrification, that regional housing needs allocation is assigned 14,000 some odd new units for Marin County by 2030. So it's a lot. Uh, one of the reasons we're really pushing right now to get this ordinance countywide is to make sure that all of those uh, new units whether they're apartments or single family, whatever they are, are all electric. And the good news is it's cheaper to build new all electric with the heat pumps than it would be to put in the gas infrastructure. And the reason's obvious. You eliminate all the gas infrastructure. These buildings are all gonna have wiring no matter what. So it's, it's very, very low cost to put a little bit beefier wiring you completely eliminate the gas infrastructure. So just, I want to be clear that in terms of, uh, you know, what we're talking about for uh, all electric ordinance for, for new buildings, it will actually reduce the building costs compared to if they were dual fuel. Mm -hmm. Any closing thoughts that are short? <laughs> <laughs> you made a good point, Leslie, of what folks can do. Is it when you're, when our um, elected are trying to pass these electrification codes, you might call them, you'll hear them called electrification reach codes, show up in support um, in order to potentially uh, counterbalance um, the, the voices of, um, that are, you know, making it difficult for our electeds to, to make that decision. So to your point, yes, that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I'll say also something, David and I work together a lot and um, we were talking earlier, Dave was saying how, uh, you know, with Zoom and the pandemic, one of the uh, outcomes that was beneficial is accessing public meetings yeah. and that it's so much easier to just, you know, show up and public comment or when there's a particular issue. Um, and you really, it's, it's really opened up democracy in many ways that it was very difficult before to, for people. So I think that that's um, a thing we are really, you know, talking about is, and the influence, I will tell you that attending a lot of these city council meetings, people don't show up. They really don't. And if you have just one thing you can go and talk about, it makes a massive difference. And I know our elected officials, I think sometimes people think elected officials are, you know, crass or, you know, they, this is not true in Marin County. And I tell people that all the time and at the state level as well. Most politicians I met are in it because they care. They want to make a difference. They want to hear from us. So I really encourage everybody, if you're not attending your city council meetings or you know, MCE meetings, et cetera, you know, please join in. It's Zoom has made it really easy and your voice can be heard. And not everyone is comfortable with public speaking as we sit here. But you can write letters. Yep. You can watch. You can read. And I think, and, and one of the things that Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, um, she's a climate scientist in Texas, and she's an evangelist, which, you know, in the way we have sort of been uh, conditioned to think about the other, she's a climate scientist and an evangelist. And what she says is the most important thing we can do about climate change is to talk about it. Yeah to talk about it, to talk about it with other people and not necessarily people you know well who necessarily agree with you. That's the, that's the listening, you guys said that so well. I don't remember which one of you did, but it was, it was brilliant. It was, you know, it was you, Sarah. 
Um, it, it's that idea of listening to each other and seeing each other and being respectful, being gentle. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that we really, uh, as humans uh, in community, have to like, really start working harder on. Um, I think, obviously, this group is, is, is not, um, but in the larger community in, in our world right now, things are pretty, pretty desperate. So I would encourage that. Um, I had some closing thoughts, um, but I'm going to skip those, um, I think. Um, can we show the very last thing? If you are sitting at a table and you have a program in front of you, turn it over. Because what we've been talking about is, what can you do right now? And we're going to show a really quick film. Um, and I'm going to encourage you to download the Climate Action Now app on your phone. Don't have to. There's no test. But it's free. And it will give you, there are thousands. I actually was, I'm on the board. <clears throat> and I also was doing content development. But I think it's a really cool app. Um, and it gives you thousands of actions that you can take, all kinds of actions, writing to electeds in, in your town, in your state, in your country, and writing to companies to say thank you for doing X, or Ugh, could you not do that again? Um, so it's, it's just a lot, and it's competitive, you can form teams, it's really quite cool. So we're going to show the film, and I think. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. Mrs. Houston, say again, please. Earth is our spaceship. It gave us life. It sustains us. And right now, it is dying. The problem is simple. Our planet is warming. And that's destroying the natural systems on which our existence depends. The world's scientific community is telling us that if we don't make rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes, the consequences will be catastrophic. I'm Brett Walter, founder and CEO of Climate Action Now. I made my career in Silicon Valley as a software entrepreneur, but I believe that now, with your help, we can finally do something that really matters. Climate Action Now has a single mission, to help people like you and me take individual and collective action to bring about the systemic change needed to reverse global warming. Most Americans feel helpless. They think nothing they do can make a difference. But it is only by taking action, first as individuals and then as a society, that the fight for our planet can be won. We start with an app that lets you take thousands of planet-saving actions in a matter of seconds, right from your smartphone. Actions like calling your political leaders to demand change, petitioning CEOs to step up to the plate, and sharing critical information with friends and co-workers. Most actions you take earn points. And as you earn points, Climate Action Now will plant real trees on your behalf trees that will draw carbon pollution out of the atmosphere for decades to come. Every action you take will automatically post to a community feed where others can draw inspiration, add their comments, and share their own actions. Community is critical. And with Climate Action Now, you'll be joining a global community of like-minded individuals who are working together to save our beautiful world. You can follow any member of the community and others can follow you. You can create or join teams to see who can take the most actions. Together, we will take millions of actions that can bring about the systemic change needed to heal the planet. And when your kids and grandkids ask what you did about the greatest threat to ever confront humanity, you'll have an answer. You helped launch the company the movement that put climate action in the hands of millions and helped restore balance to this amazing place we call Earth. I want to thank all of these wonderful people. You are 
remarkable people to, to know and to work with, um, and I just appreciate all that you do. I know there's so many, in, a, in, a, in one morning in March, we can't explore all the issues, we can't look at all the data, the science, we can't explore all the solutions, but we can start, and we did that this morning. And um, I'm really grateful to all of you, all of you. Um, and I'm particularly, where did she go? Ah, okay. So keep her out there for a second. And, and flowers. Thank you so much. This has been one of those days. I think it's the full moon. I think it's the full moon. <laughs> I was just thinking when our students were up there that um, uh, they were born shortly after Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, if, yes. if, if I may, I, I may you, have a, a fun way to close this. I was going to invite them up, but you can you can close it. Can, you want to come up too? Yeah. I just want we we've been asked to make individual pledges today, and and I want to invite you all to stand up, and and make a collective pledge. And if you feel so moved, just say it with me. And, and then whatever you all want to close with after I, I finish, please be welcome to do so. so. So here's what I used to say every morning. And if you feel so inclined, make a circle, hold hands. If not, it's fine. <laughs> right? But this is what I used to say every morning in my kindergarten class. I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance. To the earth. To the earth. And to all the life. And to all the life. Which it supports. Which it supports. To the land. To, to the, the land, land, to the trees, to the trees, to the air, to, to the air, air, and to the water, and to the water, to all the four leggeds, to, to all the four legged, and all the two leggeds, and all the two leggeds, one planet, one planet, in our care, in our care, with liberty, with liberty, and sustenance, and sustenance for all, for all. Thank you. Nice. Do you need a microphone? They might, because I think their loud mics are off. Okay. Good borrow. Yeah. Oops. prepared, so I guess I'm just kind of making stuff up as I go. Um, but I just want to say that everybody in this room can make a difference, and there are so many different voices in here. And like we all said earlier, we all have strengths to play off of, so we should all be listening to each other, and we should all be trying to understand where we're all coming from, because that's the only way we're ever going to make a difference. Um, we heard a lot of wisdom today, so I would just say, uh, if you heard anything, learned anything new, uh, felt you know, felt your heart hurt a little bit watching those videos, hearing hearing our speakers, um, dig into that, learn more, research more, uh, see what sparks your inspiration and your interest. Again, like you just said, our our daily actions can make a difference, but also how we choose to spend our time and spend our dollars really has an impact. Like they have said before, I honestly, I'm so grateful for this experience. I feel like coming into this, I didn't really know a lot about climate change. I knew some things, but 
I feel like just being here and hearing you guys speak and learning new things have really made me honestly like a lot more optimistic and I feel like there's just so much more that we can do and that I can do and I feel like I'm ready to like literally go back to school and like you know share what I have learned and talk and meet new people so thank you so much. We've gotten a little verklempt today, you know? This is marvelous. Also, no one made a pledge over there and, and took, okay, thank you, um, it took pictures. Um, oh, you did? Oh, 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 thank you, that's, oh, that, fabulous, thank you, that's marvelous. Um, but I think what you just said, we're, we're, that was brilliant, pledging to go forth um, and, um, and do what we need to do, and, and doing it with joy. And I, I, one of the things I, I really took from um, what, what Riasa said about the, that balance between fear and hope. And you know, if we are only in fear, we stop. And we need, we need each other and we need hope to, be, to keep doing the hard work, because it's hard work. But it's also marvelous. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank, thank you. you.